What's going on? Good morning. Happy Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Pete Thamel reporting last night. Kentucky finalizing a five-year deal to make BYU coach Mark Pope the school's next head coach. Pope is 110-51, and 51, including a 66-12 and 12 record at the Marriott Center during his five-year tenure at BYU. Some NFL signings yesterday. Ray are this close to the draft, but signings nonetheless has the Eagles signing uh, tight end C.J. Uzama Giants, signing defensive tackle Jordan Phillips, 49ers signing cornerback Rocky Asin, Jets re-signing safety Ashton Davis, and the Cowboys adding their offensive line room in Chuma Idoja. And less than two weeks away from the draft, we have a list of the first round prospects who will attend the draft in person and a noticeably shorter list than usual with 30 13 prospects who will be in Detroit. Most notably, the quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, will all be in attendance, as will the superstar wide receivers, Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Good Friday morning and welcome in to a Friday edition of Ramon, Kayla, and Will. And on that day, you know, on a Friday, you know, we always like to have a little bit more fun. We like to loosen up a little. Like, we're always loose. But on Fridays, we just, we feel a little bit more free. Alongside our 11-year NFL veteran involved for life, it is Ramon Foster. Yay, yay. We've got Robert Walsh, Bert, Bert, behind the glass, and his hair is down, folks. So watch out. <laughs> hide your wife. Hide your children. Don't let them watch the stream because if they see him, they might fall in love. I'm Kayla Anderson. Will Bowling has the weekend off, so he is uh, in the beach atmosphere today. I'm so jealous of him. Yeah. But we'll warm it up here in the studio, folks. Uh, yeah, we will. I, I hope I hope you get a little frost down there on, on, on the sand. Okay, right? How about that? Yeah, Wake up with frost on I, the window. I, I don't want to see him come back tanned and nah. round and, and happy and none of those types of things. Feet nah. in the water. Kayla, no, nah, screw that. You know what, though? It will be nice here this weekend, folks. It will be. And that means maybe your pool's opening early maybe your friend has a pool and they've got it ready to go mine does <laughs> really my neighbor does yeah absolutely they opened theirs up like, like two weekends ago knocking on the door hey yeah, we're ready absolutely as always we are brought to you by brewed up by eighth and roast uh eighth and roast cultivating community by the cup you can find your favorite retail bag pretty much wherever you go and shop for groceries now kroger publix Whole Foods as well. We got a fun show lined up for you today. There's a lot of news, um, especially overnight with Bert just doing the um, update there. But Mark Pope looks to be the guy (laughs) that Kentucky is going to be hiring because it looks like nobody else wanted to go to Kentucky. (laughs) So uh, I understand that he played for the Wildcats. I understand that... There's that part of it that, you know, you've got to have some of the tradition sustained there. But I just feel overall, man, they reached on this one. <laughs> no. Okay. No. What happened was they were up at bat and they swing and a miss. Yes. <laughs> and guess what happened when they went to Scott Drew? Swing, swing and a miss. <laughs> you know what, Kayla? And then when they thought they'd get Dan Hurley, swing and a miss. Oh, my gosh. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna sympathize with him for a second, but y'all know how I feel about these types of things, man. Like mm. this was say what you want about about Kyle. Say what you want about his processes. He was the draw. Okay. He was a draw. As of late. As of late, he was a draw. <laughs> he was, as far as Kentucky basketball is concerned. The brand was, of course, yes, UK is elite. They are a blue blood. Mm-hmm. 100%. I'll never take that away from when you think about good basketball. 
North Carolina, Duke, Kansas, Kentucky, they always come up right. And, of course, you're going to throw UConn in there. Definitely deserve that. Uh, and there's a few more. UCLA, USC have been in a, that conversation before, Kayla. It's not like it's, they're not one of those types of school. But considering they're, they're having to settle upon, and I'm going to say settle. I yeah, am, I respectfully. Think it's fair. Mark Pope. Um, when they went after big names, Scott Drew, they thought they can get guys like Dan Hurley. I know Bruce Pearl name came mm-hmm. up, and there was a multitude of other coaches that were at other universities uh, that UK thought the brand would do. You know, would would the hey they would come crawling over glass to have this job. I remember talking about this is in the old version of of, of this morning show uh, that I was a part of with Jason. It was just the one thing that will bring you back or create an even playing field these days is money. And it ain't even the money for the coaches. Like older schools, like big time universities, whether that's Georgia, your LSUs, your Texas, they could use their money for coaches. Right. Now every university, we we joked and played around the other day about, dang, every SEC school got a major donor, you know? And because of that, those donors want to win. Those donors want to see good players come to their universities and win for them also. We call it exactly what it is. You are paying to play these days. And what that signifies, too, is you now have other universities, i.e. Arkansas. You throw Nebraska out there, right? Mm-hmm. You see some of the stuff that Cincinnati or Illinois is doing. Syracuse even made a splash in sports. Right now, you got Rutgers basketball with two, Kayla, two McDonald's All-Americans. Think, when was the last time Rutgers was good at basketball, Kayla, to your knowledge? Mm, uh, I'll have to go back and do my research exactly. on that. Exactly. That's the answer I was looking That's for right there. We can't remember. Mm-mm. You know why Rutgers is, is being able to compete and get McDonald's All-Americans and they didn't go to Duke or Kentucky or, or Kansas? N-I-L. Your jobs now take, I think, a little bit of the luster off if you're not one of those type of coaches or you have that that type of respect as a university that people want to be there, right? Nobody wants to follow up a legacy person in general, though. It's hard. Like, Anywhere. Even fo- as good as you are maybe following exactly. up a legacy person, right? Like, there's no benefit when you are either teetering on greatness yourself, like a Scott Drew or somebody like that that's been established for a while, and you want to follow up Kyle. That's a, that's a lot to ask, right? And especially if you're at a, at a university where they're pr- practically giving you everything that you want. Mm-hmm. That's one thing about Mark. Mark. Uh, Mark. What's the name? The uh, uh, the Dan Hurley. Right after the game, he had a smirk and a smile on his face when he was bragging about how UConn they give me all the resources I need. Why would he leave to go to Kentucky? And he has a chance to build a dynasty. He has a chance to win three straight titles. Like, you would think a guy who's competitive, which Dan Hurley is, like, he's going to want to stay. Like you said, he's got everything he needs there right now. And a lot of these coaches do. Kyle took a little bit of a pay cut to go there, uh, go to Arkansas. And I think that pay cut, probably a million of that, probably went to his NIL collective Mm -hmm. for his guys. But, man, this is – what I tell you, you guys is this, man. If you're a U.K. fan, hey, talk to your Vols friends, okay? We've been through this search where you've gotten denied. You've, we've gone through this where you swing and miss on coaches. And for years, we were talked about as far as getting Lane back, right? We were talked about as far as just Gruden watch. Like, we've been in this scenario. Now, again, I don't, I don't know what Mark Pope is going to be able to do as far as what Kentucky is going to want him to do as far as coaching. Uh, but it will be fascinating to see the brand. And I'm going to say that the brand somewhat take a hit, no matter how people feel about mm-hmm. UK, the fans of that school or people that admire what UK has done. I've seen the University of Tennessee take hits. I've seen Miami take a hit. I've seen Florida State take a hit. I've seen all these universities have to take a very long walk around the park two, three times before you get back to a respectable point. All right, and that comes through winning. That comes through stability. And right now, as far as everybody's comments on and and, and opinions about Kentucky's athletic director, it doesn't seem like it's going to get any better until they get rid of him. And then what happens? You fire him, and then the coaches don't do well, so you got to fire them also and hire. This is where your battered Kentucky syndrome kicks in, okay? We've lived this life as Vols fans. Kayla, I'm sure. You all have dealt with that at Washington State in a sense, right? It's like, golly, we got to keep our guy. Man, when are we going to get to that level of winning? Hey, welcome to the shadows, okay?
legitimately Kentucky fans, unless Mark Pope and y'all believe in him. And I know, like you said, they went back to the nostalgia aspect of, oh, we got yeah. a former player on the national championship team. Guess who just did that? The Vols or Kelly Harper, right? And guess how that worked out? Well, she's not here anymore. A F- few years ago when we all, uh, when former came back into the building, right? How did mm-hmm. that work out? They pretty much sent coach away for a million dollars in a year, right? I get it. You want that. Again, it may have been necessary to change from Kyle, um, but this is where the BKS comes in, right? The battered yeah. Kentucky syndrome. But I think that's all that they had. I, I really do. And I think if anything, the one thing that they can hold on to with this hire of Mark Pope, who was at BYU in his five years, uh, two NCAA tournaments, 23-11 and 11 record, um, and then obviously they transitioned into the Big 12 this last season. He, and he's gone 110 and 52 at BYU. Let me just add that to that. Um, here's the thing. They had nobody else to turn to at this point. And they went and hired Mark Pope because the one thing that they have to make a connection there is the fact that he played at Kentucky. And if anything, I guess, you know, he knows about the tradition. He went to two NCAA tournaments, I believe, when he was a player, a Final Four appearance and um, a national title appearance. So I think that is what they had left. And they said, if anything, at least we can bring in somebody who still can keep the tradition, the blue blood, you know, (laughs) name alive. But here's the thing. It's been a digression there and really coach Cal's name has kept them in the mix in terms of getting attention and getting the benefit of the doubt although we've seen the product has not been great in terms of the postseason at least you were hanging on to that well coach Cal is there and coach Cal puts guys in the league you always felt like he was gonna get it back right because he's coach Cal and he and he has had a background of winning But now you've got a guy in here who is probably going to recruit different, who's probably not going to be known for one and dones and putting guys in the league. So now what do you got to be known for? You better be known for competing with the SEC at the top and winning when it counts in the NCAA tournament. And if it doesn't happen, then yes, Mitch Barnhart is out the door and so is Pope. No and doubt now it's it. a reset again, and that's when you start looking at the Indianas, the the programs that had once been so great that have struggled to get back on the map. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's gonna be fascinating, man. Again, uh, Kentucky Wildcats fans, who big big time basketball fans, like le- legitimately, like go go attach yourself to somebody from from UT. We can walk you guys through this, man. I promise you, man. Or, you know, somebody from, from, from Indiana basketball. <laughs> like, we'll walk you guys yeah. through that, man. It's, it's, or Nebraska football fan. Like, we we can guide you guys through this next phase, okay? Because, okay, I'd I love to hear from the U.K. fans this morning, just a reaction from them, if this hire does go through. That. Uh, but yeah, man, welcome, uh, welcome to the show, y'all. It's about to get real for you. Welcome to the dark side. Uh, Bill Bender, by the way, of the Sporting News, he will join us later in the show at 920. He'll dive deeper into this hire and a little bit more on what's going on in the college basketball world because the Vols also lost another uh, big guy to the transfer portal. So we'll talk about that. Plus, coming up, uh, Will Levis. He is being surrounded by tons of talent with a new head coach, offensive-minded head coach at that But what are the expectations? How long is the leash on Will Levis? And how does Mason Rudolph play into all of this? We'll get to that and more coming up this morning on RK-Dub.
When it comes to large home repairs, I'm going to have to repair Bert's home after this May. Couldn't believe that was Jim right there. It was. Uh, when it comes to large home repairs, though, a lot of the homes, a lot of the time we homeowners, we pretend we do not see the warning signs. We are afraid of what we're going to hear. This is especially true with waterproofing and foundation repair. It could be something big that needs needs to be fixed right away, or maybe a small problem now that'll become bigger later, or it could be nothing at all. The bottom line is we don't know, but we certainly don't want to be sold something we do not need. What we need is a peace of mind. And United Structural Systems is the company to give you that. Over 25,100% satisfy residential customers. And here's how they make that happen. When USS comes out to your house, you're going to get a problem solver who provides a peace of mind to their customers. That's the homeowner. You're not going to get someone who's worried about meeting a sales quota, upselling the next big thing. But someone there to educate you and help you understand what is happening with your home. At USS, the only measure of success is how satisfied the homeowner is and not a closing ratio, all right? And if you're having foundational waterproofing issues, that's something you want to get fixed right away simply because it devalues your home. When you're trying to sell it, people are going to knock you for it, knock their price down. And we're in Middle Tennessee right now where it's raining and the grounds is saturated. So if you check those basement walls outside and that foundation somewhat shifted, reach out to the people that I trust, man, A United Structural System. They serve Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, and Western Kentucky. You can reach them online at USSTN.com or call them 
Welcome back into RK Dub on this fine Friday. <clears throat> and you can always listen to us, of course, on your radio dial, but you can also watch us and you can, you know, see what Ramon Foster is sporting today in terms of his baseball jersey. Uh, I'll leave pirates. that up to you guys. I like that. Today. Appreciate that, man. Got to support the old squad. You do. You do. A great stadium, too. So watch us Beautiful. on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Twitch, please. He was on that one, bro. Got him. I got him. Today. He was on he, that. Yeah, I'm saying he wake up about seven forty five today. Yeah. Be early. It's Masters. Early. We got it's Masters weekend, so we yes. got early tee times at six forty five to finish the first round. So uh, that'll be interesting. We'll give you a little update here uh, coming up in about thirty minutes. But we're gonna talk a little Titans because they are in the building. Mm-hmm. They got to be in the building a little bit early with the rule of when you have a rookie head coach. Yeah. You get to get in the building a little bit earlier. So the Titans decided to do it this week. So we had chatted with them on Wednesday. Ramon Foster also there with me as we were uh, entertained always by the media. And I thought some good questions and I thought some really great answers by the coaches and coordinators, Denard Wilson and Nick Holtz. And one of those questions asked off the bat about Will Levis was to Nick Holtz and that's where we'll kind of start with this conversation because there was a lot of questions about you know how is Will Levis developing as a leader Uh, because obviously we know his development on the field needs to be there too this season this is what Nick Holtz said about his initial uh, reaction in meeting Will Levis when you're around Will he kind of sometimes doesn't give you a lot. You know, he's kind of very stoic at times. And so you're kind of, all right, is this guy? And now that we've been in, you know, that was just as our, you know, handshake meetings, get to know you, tell me about yourself. And now that we're kind of into the football, you really see him, his brain working and his process through it. And he asks great questions. You know, it's only been two days and he comes back with the questions in the morning. So he'll come in and, hey, what was this? What were we saying this? Why did this mean? And so you see how it's all hitting him. And then you see his opinions. You know, he's got thoughts on hey what does this look like hey have you guys done this and so that's been really cool just to see kind of now that we're getting into the football part just mentally in the classroom how kind of serious he takes it and how much it means to him look i i appreciated the uh answer there by nick holtz because he said at first maybe wasn't you know easy to warm up to but the minute that football was the subject Mm -hmm. will levis was completely engaged. And I think the thing you have to love about him and what you saw last year in that short period of time where he played nine games was that he is going to be the guy that's going to be studying. He is going to have the playbook out. He is going to be going over film because he's dedicated to his craft. Now it's a matter of how does that translate on the field under a new staff What I do like about this fit with Will Levis and this staff, uh, particularly Brian Callahan, is Callahan has worked with so many quarterbacks, and we've heard him say that the biggest thing with that relationship is he wants the quarterback to ask questions. He wants them, uh, the quarterback, to give thoughts on things he likes and that he doesn't like. So I feel like this will work with that situation, But how does it translate on the field, Ramon? And how much do we need to see out of Will Levis in this second season to know he's the guy? No doubt. Uh, Marcellus and FNM Bank Chat said Vrabel made his heart cold. (laughs) I thought that was was pretty hilarious right there. Marcellus, that was pretty solid right there. Uh, One, one, Kayla, it has to translate. It does. I, I think there's probably more pressure on Will Levis this year than almost any player on this roster. And that's even including Traylon, Raidens, and NPF. I, I think, and Caleb Farley, I throw him in that conversation too. Because again, the success of this team, or most teams, is based upon what the quarterback is capable of doing. How good is he? How, how much better does he get? And everybody will always say, we need that year one to year two jump. You're no longer a rookie anymore because now he's in the building early. He's not in the pre-draft uh, mode right now where he's visiting and going on trips and doing his 30 visits and whatnot, right? So that's where, to me, Kayla, um, the introduction that Nick Holtz said 
and and how they've pretty much opened up right now is, is super unique. Again, I get Will Levis. This is all new to him. Probably don't want to say too much. Don't want to be a over talker. Don't want to be a guy that tried to make it seem like, okay, I've made it. No, he's still a young guy. You got to play your role. So the fact that he was uh, stoic or standoffish, you know, as far as Nick Holtz is concerned and his dealings with him, I think is uh, one, just Will Levis just being a pro. But two, again, as he said, uh, the next few days after that, he engaged with him. He had the ability to ask questions. And Will Levis, to me, is the typical quarterback that Brian Callahan and Nick Holtz, I think, want as a quarterback. Yeah. One of the things that was uh, said about Brian Callahan in this pre-hiring process for him was the detail that him and Joe Burrow had. You know, they had an answer for every play on every scenario. And if that's what Will Levis is seeking, then the pairing of Brian Callahan, Nick Nick Holtz, and uh, Will Levis is going to be beautiful if it can compute and translate over to the football field. He's got the world in his hands right now as far as this Nashville team goes. And the delivery of the goods on Sundays and third Thursdays and Monday nights, Kayla, is going to be crucial for him. Um, I, I think, again, as I said a second ago, he is the guy for the job. But having a, a, a classroom smart guy versus a playmaker on the field is what we're looking for. To be able to ingest this offense and command the respect of your teammates and this coaching staff, too, to see how far they can let you go with it, I think he's capable of it. I think Will Levis has played at a place coming from Penn State, then going to Kentucky to try to be the guy there to where he's always had to force himself, always had to be in a position to where he was a guy that had to make plays. With this team that they've built around him, and we can say they've built a, a, a squad around him from, of course, having some young tight ends that got to grow, mm-hmm. uh, but having wide receivers and two running backs in front of him and beside him, I think the sky's the limit for a guy that's presented with something like this. Now, protection has to be a part of it. And also just his playmaking ability. If the player requires you to stay in the pocket, stay in the pocket and deliver the goods. Okay, there's going to be pressure. And I know you might have a little PTSD from getting sacked and hurt last year as a rookie. 28 sacks last season in nine games, by that's, the way. That's, that's iffy right there, Kayla. <laughs> it, it just is. And it can cause you to, you know, be shell-shocked, dude, because of that pressure that you – and those hits and those – nobody wants to be injured because of somebody else's lack of play. And that's something I'm hoping that they either address through coaching. I'm going to say coaching first mm-hmm. as far as the offensive line goes. And not just them. The setting up of protections, too. I I will always say protecting the quarterback is a team thing that starts with the quarterback getting rid of the ball when he has to. Get rid of this three-step drop, the ball should be out within a – I'm talking about a half a second, half five-step drop. Your protection going to hold up a little bit longer, but that's on you. And, of course, on the seven steps where you got to turn his back or something like that and let the play develop, that's a little bit of, you know, the old line got to hold up because probably more people uh, down the field. But with that being said, team protection, quarterback protection, and then the O-line scheming. I I do think, and I'll always go back to the fact that Joe Burrow took a lot of heat his first couple years in Cincinnati also before they started to get their offensive line That line line was crap, too. And and I'm hoping for the sake of Will Levis, right, Mm -hmm. that and for Brian Callahan and his offense also that they learn from that. All right, if we have – below the line guys as far as protecting and they're not going to protect for long, then I've been in situations before with Joe Burrow where I know how to navigate around setting him up inside the pocket or moving the pocket around. So that's the other thing. But they seem to be high on Levis. Levis understands what's in front of him. It is his squad as it stands right now. And I, I think he will get the first stab at it to see how good he can operate this thing. And it, it, it comes to smoothing it over, though, Kayla. Can he make the touch passes? Can he not throw across his body in moments like that? Can he hit the deep ball? And what's this relationship going to be like between Calvin Ridley, D-Hop, Traylon, and everybody else behind it? And the mm-hmm. other side of this, too, what helps Will Levis even more is this. Having Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears take some of the pressure off of his plate, too. That will be huge. And um, I ended up asking, I should have asked the question, like I told you in front of you mm-hmm. guys, um, to Brian Callahan, who's, who's helping set the offense? And uh, when they break the huddle, it will be Cushenberry pointing out the mic and settling yeah. up um, where this offense, I mean, where the defensive mic point is. And that should ho- ho- hopefully settle him in and just let him go play ball. So yeah. the world's in his hands right now as far as Nashville is concerned because whenever they hit the field for OTAs and team drills and stuff like that, it's got to look good, Kayla, if he's that smart of a player and want to be that good of a quarterback. Yeah, and – 
it is hard to compare last season and to what he, you know, might be able to do this season just because there were so many limitations last year. You know, with the offensive line not being able to hold up to the limited resources in terms of his skill position players um, to really, if you now think about it, Tim Kelly as an offensive coordinator. Do we really know who he was as an offensive coordinator? I don't think we ever answered that question. One year. One year and Uh, mixed results, more than anything, probably below average results. Yeah. And you look back at that and you're like, man, that was a rough situation for a rookie quarterback to be thrown into. And yes, he was thrown into it because the plan was for Ryan Tannehill to start that season. Mm -hmm. And that did not happen with the injuries that occurred. So it is, for me, a little bit hopeful because I think he has the tangibles. I think we've seen everything in Will Levis to say, hey, he can succeed, but we just haven't seen it on a consistent basis yet because of all these other factors. So there's no excuse, I feel like, this year. You know, it's not going to be perfect by any means, but I think they've done enough around him. And I think now you have the luxury of a Brian Callahan who's proven he's a pretty good offensive-minded coach who, by the way, will be calling the plays, um, that there will be able to have some, you know, growth for Will Levis in this situation this year. But, I mean, there's going to be expectations, no doubt about it. And the big thing now in the NFL is if you aren't seeing production in two years, it's pretty much like you're probably gone. And I don't know what the Titans backup plan for for will levis is if this is the case but i know they brought in a guy in mason rudolph who is clearly a veteran he was drafted by pittsburgh in 2018 but he's a third round pick right yeah he's he's been a backup for majority of his career and he's been a decent one as of late i know nick holtz at wednesday's press conference and you heard it too pointed out a lot of things about Mason Rudolph that he liked, including him adding in that his best ball is still to be played. Yeah. What did you take from that comment? Kayla, I, uh, I, my mouth dropped a little bit when he said that. It's like his best ball is still in front of him to be played. I was like, you usually don't talk about backup quarterbacks in that sentiment, do you? More times than not. You don't say his best ball is like he's here to support Will is what I was thinking, you know? But I, I think it somewhat was telling to uh, when, you know, some people are, will you, will look at, like, the quality of the backup quarterback. What does it look like, right? And some probably look at uh, at Mason and say, well, he was a backup for so long. And I'll say this, too, about Mason. If you talk to him, he'll say, I played my role exactly as I needed it to as a backup. Mason last year was signed later in the season as far as the offseason goes, and uh, he was number three behind Kenny Pickett, yeah. Mitch Trubisky. He had to play. I mean, had to be the backup role. So he knows how to support Will Levis. And in my conversation with him, he knows it. St- the backup quarterback stays out of the way, low- learn and grow as they allow you to and get the reps and take advantage of them. But hearing Nick Holt say, you know, we watched Mason Rudolph tape at the end of the year. We loved how he had poise in the pocket, how he commanded the line of scrimmage, and how he played. And I was just like, oh, and then, of course, you just said a second ago, Kayla. <laughs> and we both paused yeah. at that comic because we talked about it later. We did talk about it later. It's like his best ball is in front of him. See, that right there and knock chop in the uh, FNM Bank chat just asked the question a little while ago. Can Rudolph push him to be better? Now, again, there is a fine line between the backup push and the starter because it's Wills Levis's team. Yes. But there is, a, 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 you know, sentiments that – if you got a guy behind it that you know can play and you're pretty much in the same similar situation, Will Levis is still trying to prove himself as a player, as a starter in this league, and so is Mason Rudolph, who's also played and started in this league and helped Pittsburgh make it to the playoffs. It will be fascinating, Kayla, if, again, as for a guy in the second, that's a second rounder, that's mm-hmm. in the second year, I mean, the timeline is sped up as far as the decisions that's got to be made for him. Uh, this ain't a make it a break year for Will Levis, but the answers to to the questions that we have have to be seen this year. Can he stay in the pocket and not roll out? Is it uh, so? I I went back and looked at one of the profiles on Will Levis, a scouting report on him, and this is some of the stuff that you said that need to be somewhat nixed going into year two. One of the the scouting weaknesses was his athletic gifts are not in doubt. His mechanics are still pretty raw. 
Doesn't pick up blitzes. I think we've seen that somewhat. Yes, but, have. of course, the offensive line is an issue with that, right? Last year, so I'll give him that. Needs to improve his touch on all levels and knows when to, when to gun it and when to take something off his throws. Has had issues with patience in the pocket. Quickly gives up on the play and takes off. It was the opposite of Mason Rudolph last year. He stayed in the pocket, delivered, let the play develop, and stuff like that. And I think if you look at some of these uh, issues that Will Levis was presented with, I think, yes, he rolled out of the pocket at times. Remember, you needed him to stay in. Sometimes your athletic ability needs to just be cut, and it's no further than that. So if you're asking me, do I think Mason Rudolph can help this team and push him and help also Will Levis grow? The answer is yes. But, of course, um, both of those guys got a lot to prove, and it starts with Will Levis first. It does. Look, I think it's a a good situation to be in. I think the Titans were smart about – how they went and found a backup. Because I know we had so many names that we threw out there as being a guy that could potentially be a backup. And it's not just a waste of a conversation because look at what you saw last year in terms of backups having to play. Like, it was insane how many starters were down at points during the season. We're talking about backups that are playing meaningful games. I mean, hell, look at Gardner Minshew. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he put himself now in, for now at least, in Vegas, a starting role oh. because of his backup play. So you always have to have, nowadays more than anything, a backup who your team believes in just as much as a starter. Yeah. I just so, I just never heard a coach, uh, and it was, I don't listen it was to many weird. pressers. Yeah. And have you heard it before, too? Say we think his best ball is, is in front of him. And you know it's what? yet to come. That, that also could mean, Ramon, they take a lot of pride, and we've said this time and time and again, of developing players. It doesn't matter if you're a backup. It doesn't matter. I think this coach, real this coaching staff really takes it upon themselves to make whoever they have better. But I say that, and I know we got to go to break, but that's the same thing that Cincinnati benefited from Jake Browning at the end of the Boom. year, too. Boom. So quality matters, even at the backup quarterback position. Absolutely. Great point there. Let's switch gears a little bit here. We're going to dip into the Masters because they are teeing off in about five minutes here. Uh, big day one. A lot of things coming out of day one, including Tiger Woods looked pretty good. And I know he's hurting every day, but it did not look like it. We'll get into who's leading the way and uh, what we're looking forward to today. That's coming up on RKW here on 104.5 The Zone. What's going on? It's Will Bowling. Does your garage door struggle to open or close? Are the wheels falling off the track? Maybe that remote works some days, decides it doesn't want to work other days. Well, the professional Lee Company team, they got you covered for all of your garage door service needs. And right now, they got a great offer for you. You can enjoy $50 off a garage door repair or tune-up. You got to contact Lee Company today at 615 567 1000 or visit leecompany.com to make an appointment. That's leecompany.com for $50 off your next garage door repair or tune up. And I always recommend trusting these guys. They have 80 years of experience, they've been in the business since 1944. Open 24-7 with 14 community locations, over 950 vehicles in their fleet. They're there to help you at a moment's notice. 615-567-1000. That's how you call Lee Company online at LeeCompany.com. That's Lee Company. All you need.
Welcome back into RK Dub. Maybe uh, you put a little money, money on the Masters. <laughs> Who's your pick to win? We we said a couple of ours yesterday, and I believe Ramon Foster uh, went with the betting favorite in Scotty Scheffler. Yay, yay. And guess what? Right oh. now, no surprise, it's looking pretty damn good. I mean, Taylor. because. <laughs> I don't like to go with the crowd look, too often. Look but at I Ramon Foster. Uh, now turn to him with all your betting advice when it comes to the uh, the golfing world. <laughs> so the golfing world. Yes. Speaking of the golf world, my son comes. Uh, I picked him up yesterday from school. My high schooler. He was like, "Dad, I guess the Masters going on." I was like, "Yeah, why? What's going?" On? I was like, "Everybody in the school is talking about." It. I'm like, "Is it really? really? Like, I know the Masters is that popular, but like, it really is an event." It really is an event, Kayla, to where the importance of that sport and how it's covered. I know I thought Will was going to pop a top yesterday if they didn't start the uh, the Masters right? on time. Which like, they didn't. It was bro, delayed. It was delayed. Hey, but I, I didn't I didn't realize, I'm going to say this, but I didn't realize it was taken that serious. Or has it just developed into a more serious, more serious conversation? No, I think this is the the special thing about sports is you don't have to be a golf fan necessarily to love or at least want to enjoy some of the Masters because of the tradition. And I think for so many sports and so many leagues and you know just the the day and time we're in and I sound like an old woman talking <laughs> like this, but tradition it it's it's hard to hold a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. and nowadays things have changed so much and a lot of it for the better. But some, you know, you say, hey, can't we just go back to being what it used to be like mm -hmm. in terms of how some of these sporting events run? Right. And so you look at the Masters and it is nothing's changed. Nothing's I mean, changed. it's the same thing that they've done year after year after year. The only thing that changes is the players in the game. Yeah. But even when you look at that, some of those players are still there trying to win the Masters trying to wear a green jacket or add to their list of green jackets. And that includes a guy like Tiger Woods, who we've seen, it's documented, like what he has gone through over the last several years in terms of his body. I mean, I don't know how he is connected. Like, I don't know how his ankle's connected to his leg or his, <laughs> yeah. you know, his back's connected to his whatever. Because it's, it's he's gone through so many surgeries and he said it before the tournament started, like, He's in pain every day, like mm -hmm. so many of us who maybe have played sports or right. gone through different things in our lives. But he's still out there playing this tournament, pride, and pride, you know, Taylor, yeah, and greatness too, man. He's great. Yeah, and he he looked good yesterday. Um, his driver looked good. I thought he looked good on you know the greens. Like I thought overall one under and he's got to complete his first round today i think he tees off around 9 30 at 10 18 eastern I think yeah when he tees off yeah so it'll be interesting to see how he reacts today because he's got to finish his round then he's got to play an, a whole nother round and that's when it starts to wear on your body a little because this is not a flat course yeah, by he's any gotta means he's got to play 23 holes today yeah yeah and it's you have to walk. Yeah, like, there's uh, nothing else. I, I was to in it. my vehicle yesterday when um, when May when three HL and we're talking about it and and Brent was saying on the back nine it's mostly downhill. Yeah, and that's what's what what was going to hurt him. Like he was limping going down the hill, and I was just like, that sounds like it sucks, you know. And they have to walk it. And uh, I know Ron said it looked like he needed a cane. It really did. You know he's not going to carry a cane. Oh, Tiger, no. Oh, you know? So whether he feels like he needed it or not, uh, as far as the way he's looked at, as far as the optics of his walk, the optics of, you know, him moving around mm -hmm. the course, it does look like he's in pain. Yeah, it does. So I, I'm rooting for him. I always do. Um, hopefully he can make the cut yet again, and he would break the streak for consecutive made cuts at the Masters, which is pretty impressive within itself. But right now, the big players, I mean, I mentioned your guy, Scotty Scheffler. Yeah. That guy just plays solid golf. Everything about his game is so impressive. Um, and I feel like he's going to be right up there again, winning two years ago at the Masters. So already has a green jacket. And the big storyline with him that's hilarious is his wife could go into labor at any time. <laughs> and he updated us yesterday. He said he's prepared to leave if that's the case. And I'm like, damn, man, you're a good man because I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be like, you just stay there, honey. Just stay. Oh my gosh, that that's Go a lot to jacket. ask, though, man. Um, just 
Just especially if he's streaking the way he is. He's right now one behind DeShambo, Bryson DeShambo. Yeah. So it, it will be interesting to see if he actually does leave. When when does he have to break and just say, hey, I'm out? You know? And, and I'm sure the Masters won't give him any grace or anything as far as it as, as it pertains to the tournament that they're planning right now. But that is uh <laughs> fatherhood is awesome. Again, I love that I, I told the story, I missed both of mine because I was traveling. So you probably look at it a yeah, lot different. I do, but if I could have been there, I definitely would have been there. Okay. Uh, I miss mine through sports, too. Coming back from a flight, missed it. Well, and then the other one was doing OTAs, but uh, my youngest had to be whisked out for an emergency C-section. So I didn't see the delivery. I was there for it. And I'm guessing his wife is, uh, are they in Georgia? Is this where they have any of that? I don't know. Either way. I don't think so. I feel like they would at least have to be close. There's no telling where he, st- where he lives at, whether it's South Carolina, Atlanta. I mean, a there's, lot of them have no hubs in Florida. Stays. Yeah, Florida. Mm-hmm, yeah, because they can, can do year round stuff there. So that's the thing. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with that. But, it, you know, and also you had mentioned Bryson DeChambeau. He has not had success at the Masters in the past, especially during first rounds. He's been awful. But he switched up his clubs. He's got, like, this new innovative club. It clearly helped because he had a, a heck of a round. And the big question with him is, like, can he sustain that? Yeah. And I, I still think there's a chance for Rory McIlroy, a, a guy that has not won a, a major in a long time. He's in the mix, too. So a lot of good storylines headed yeah. into day two of the Masters. They just teed off finishing that second, or excuse me, the first round, and then we'll get the second round action later today. So some exciting stuff, and hope you guys are enjoying that. We almost are wrapping up hour one here. We are. I mean, time flies when we're having fun here. Just a little bit. We got Hubs coming up, Brent Hubs, our guy from VolQuest. He's coming up in the next hour. We're going to talk a little bit about the Vol Spring game happening on Saturday, plus another player entering the transfer transfer portal how does that affect the the vols hoops team but first uh tom brady Mm. here he is again folks he's back in the headlines could he make a return to the field we'll discuss it coming up next on rk dub here on 104.5 the zone It's Ramon Foster for Wesley Mortgage. I'm here to tell you, man, right now I'm going to tell you the website is whywesley.com, W-H-Y-Wesley.com. And uh, it starts with the owner, Chuck McDowell, man. He's a local Nashville native who cares about the community he lives in and is proud to serve it. Chuck also reinvests in the people and the places that make Nashville such a wonderful place. While other mortgage companies, I'm sure you've heard, are downsizing, Chuck McDowell and the Wesley Mortgage Team are rapidly expanding in Nashville, keeping people working in a career that they love, and they would love to have you join their team, list, which is why I gave you the website a second ago, okay? Chuck and the leadership team at Wesley Mortgage have a support system in place to help you succeed in the mortgage business, ensuring your loans close on time, making sure you get paid, and giving you back the time to build your business and bring back the funds to, go to the mortgage professional. With unique networking opportunities with the Tennessee Titans and the Music City Grand Prix, they make closing deals and building relationships fun again. So if you're in the mortgage industry and you're tired of the grind, tired of the pressure, and tired of micromanaging everything to make sure your clients get handled correctly, then you owe it to yourself to go to whywesley.com. One of the things I love most about Genesis Diamonds is the laid back feel, the vibe, the relaxed feelings you get when you walk in. There's no commission salespeople at Genesis, never one ounce of pressure or intimidation. If you are a diamond expert or if you don't know anything about diamonds, they will make you feel at home and at ease. And you can see a wide array of GI certified diamonds all in your price range, every shape. Or if you're looking for lab grown diamonds, Genesis has those as well at prices way, way, way below what others are selling them for. And when it comes to the ring, Genesis has the ring designers that other stores can't even get. All the top brands from trusted, renowned designers like Takori and Viragia. All this plus 
free service for life on any purchase. Designer uh, jewelry that you can't find at other stores and 100% diamond upgrade guarantee. An incredible selection of pristine luxury pre-owned Rolex watches. This is Nashville's premier jeweler. Uh, voted time and time again as the best place to buy an engagement ring and the best jewelry store in Middle Tennessee. From rings, earrings, bands, bracelets, colored gemstone jewelry, all at prices other stores can only dream they could offer you. For your special occasion that's coming up, get the most value, the highest quality, and the best overall experience at Genesis Diamonds. Located in Green Hills and Cool Springs.
702. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Pete Thamel reporting late in the night last night. Kentucky finalizing a five-year deal to make BYU coach Mark Pope the next coach of the Kentucky Wildcats. Pope is 110 and 51, including 66 and 12 record at home in the Marriott Center during his five-year tenure at BYU. Some NFL signings yesterday, the Eagles snagging tight end CJ Uzama, the Giants taking defensive tackle Jordan Phillips, 49ers bringing in some secondary help with Rocky Sin, and the Jets re-signing safety Ashton Davis. Less than two weeks away from the draft, we have a list of first-round prospects who will attend the draft in person. It is noticeable shorter than usual with 13 prospects who have accepted the invitation to Detroit. We got the quarterbacks, of course, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, but also the t- uh, tandem of superstar wide receivers, Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. For all your uh, foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. It is Friday, and we are acting like it. Welcome into RK Dub, Ramon, Kayla, and Will, brought to you by 8th and Roast. Four locations now in Middle Tennessee. We got 8th Avenue, Charlotte, two in the airport, because the airport is expanding like crazy right now. (laughs) And Midtown as well. 8th and Roast Coffee Cultivates Community by the Cup. You can also find your favorite retail bag just about anywhere. Kroger, Publix. Whole Foods, uh, we've got a whole show for you today. We are with our guy, Ramon Foster. Yay. We are with Bert, 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 Robert Walsh behind the glass. He's got his hair down. That means it's Friday. And <laughs> I'm Kayla Anderson. We'll bowling off for the weekend. But I can promise you one thing, folks. It's Friday. We going to act like it. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Got to get the claps going. <laughs> I just saw Robert um fl- like fling his hair back there like Fabio. He was like well, He's just shaking his head. He, he is our Fabio. He what is our Fabio. About, okay. I'm Robbio. Robbio. <laughs> it's a bad burp season out here, okay? Come on. <laughs> get you one. I can't even drive with the windows down anymore. Too many people, too many women flaunting (laughs) myself. Are they getting into accidents now because they look over and you got... Robbio over here. Well, in the sometimes they're walk, they're walking their dogs, you know, yeah. and the, and the, and they are pulling their dogs in the opposite direction, trying to run where I'm going. So, but <laughs> what Cheyenne you tell speaks me. softly and carries a big stick. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh so, my so goodness! So what you saying? You for all the dogs yourself? I am for uh-huh. all the dogs. <laughs> we well, we're just glad we have you. Yeah, nobody I, else I, could uh, steal you away for very, three more hours. Mm-hmm. You got me. Um, I, I almost messed with you yesterday too because I did pass you on the highway after leaving work, and I was, oh no, I was I was like, do I do I blow my horn at him and like just distract him? Do I swerve in his lane a little bit? Like I had those thoughts yesterday. You probably caught me in the middle of my routine. I don't know if what picking y'all your do. Nose. No, no, it was not, it was not picking my nose. Uh, well, I might have been. I don't know. If, if Ramon would have caught me picking my nose, that would have been pretty good. Should have took a picture of that. I would have. Uh, when every day when I get off work, I call three people. I call Cheyenne. I call my mom. I call my dad every day. It's been like that since I I guess since I've been with Cheyenne, I added her to the list. But every day when I get off, I call my mama, my daddy. So you probably caught me in the middle of talking to one of them. I think you were. You were hand gesturing in the car. Oh, yeah. I was probably saying like these people I work with, man, I can't (laughs) deal with it. I can't deal with Ramon anymore. (laughs) Uh, You know what? You just like me. You know why? (laughs) 
every day I get in the get in my vehicle, I'm gonna call my wife and I'm gonna call Savage. It's gotten to the point now I call her, we talk, I say, hey, I gotta call you back, I gotta call Savage. Like mm-hmm. it's just that I got that same routine also. The car is where I have most of my conversation at anyway. And then God I'm forbid too. God forbid somebody mess up the order of it. Like I'll call Cheyenne and then she, she won't answer. answer. I'll call my mom, and then she calls me back. I'm like, no, yes. you had your time. You had your chance. You had an opportunity to get in line with the Bert. You, if you wanted to talk to Bert on the phone, you should have called. And uh, and then I it, make knocks my order all out of whack, but we're rocking and rolling. It's Friday. And, uh, Kayla, I don't know if you've ever met Cheyenne before. You get to meet no, Cheyenne this weekend. I am so excited to meet Cheyenne. I have a feeling we're going to get along, and it might not be a good thing for y'all. Um, That's what I'm worried about. I told her if she doesn't act right, I will turn the car around. I'll turn the car around right now. The the amount of times my dad said that to me and my brother. Holy smokes. But we're going to all be at the Predators game on Saturday. So if you're going and you happen to see us, come say hi. The Predators' last regular um, home game, regular regular season season home game. game. So it should be a good one against the Blue Jackets. And then the playoffs starting up in about a week. So Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun. I don't know what kind of havoc we're going to get into, though. I mean, we got Slay Dog coming. I know Brent's coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, who Bart's else? coming. Yeah. Uh, Mickey Blaine. Mickey Blaine. Uh, yeah, I, I know think Bananas will be there. Maybe. Jo- yeah, Joseph. So Joseph. My, my issue is I want to bring a fish in. I want to throw a fish on the a ice. A catfish. But I, it is – so I, people do it like every game, but then it's like frowned upon. So is it is it faux pas for me to go out there and throw a fish on the ice? It, also, I say do it. And then does that hurt my chances of then driving the Burt Boney later <laughs> in my career? Later later in, in the years when I'm here for longer and longer, is that going to hurt my chance? They're going to remember, Burt threw a fish on the ice. We're not going to let him drive the Zamboni. You should tell him it's full circle. You threw a fish on, oh, now you want to clean it up. There you go. Okay. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, I got, make my I mess am, did I and become, I'll clean it up. Did I become your lawyer now? Or I just let it go. Oh, you better talk it? to Slay about that before you make the decision. I'm a mediator. Right. To be my lawyer, you got to be taller than 6'4". I am. I am taller. You better than come four. to yoga class I then. I don't think so. I thought, I, I'm I thought you were definitely six four, six, four, six six in <laughs> shoes. I am a combine height six five and five eight. You know we all Take shrink that. when we get older though. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> you better do some stretching, Ramon. Uh, I'll tell you about one guy though who doesn't think he's getting older. Tom Brady. Oh my god. Dude, does the guy ever just say I'm 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 moving on in my life? He's he's got a hot new girlfriend. He moved on in that. That we know of. That we know of. (laughs) Exactly. However, um, he appeared on the Deep Cut podcast. You can get into that deeper if you want. Um, Brady was asked by the host Vic Blends whether he would pick up the phone if a team called him uh, in the event of, let's say, an injury or something. Mm. It's kind of an emergency situation. He says, quote, I'm not opposed to it. I don't know if they are going to let me if I become an owner of an NFL team. I'm always going to be in good shape. I'm always going to be able to throw the ball. So to come in for a little bit like MJ, Michael Jordan, coming back, I don't know if they would let me, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. Look at Brady just always leaving a crack open. Hello, I'm going to be real. I hate this. So do I. I do. I hate this. Like, there's nobody, Tom, you did it. It's fine. I promise you, you go, you're a walking gold jacket right now. Just walk into the sunshine. Like, that's that's all I'm asking you to do. It's like the sun has set on your career. There's no reason for you to tease us, uh, have us talking about it on, ter- on terrestrial radio. Like, I I get it. You were that good, and you still have it. Also, but it's, it's, it's just one of those situations where it's almost attention-seeking to me in a sense. But I get it. If you want it, hey, let everybody know that you want it in these situations. But there's, I don't know how much good can come out of Tom Brady coming back a year later to say, yes, I'll save your team. It's a bigger distraction than I think it is a benefit in that sense. You mean to tell me in the playoffs, you're going to call Tom Brady up and put him in a situation where he has to learn the playbook. You're supposed to be able to protect for a guy like him. And I'm guessing if somebody got injured, it's probably because he's a bad old line player that got cleaned up like mm-hmm. Tom. And they're younger than you. You getting hit right now at your big old age, like... Of 46? No. Yeah, I'm sorry. Tom, just tell him no. Like, who cares? You get enough attention, and you're going to be on the broadcast for Fox Sports next year. You're going to be the number one broadcast guy, the number one team. That's that's the number one team that he's joining next year Mm -hmm. on the Fox Fox broadcast. You're going to have plenty of attention that's going to come your way. 
And, you know, he's said himself it's going to be something different. It's going to be a challenge. So then just close the damn door on close your career. Just well, close it. Close. He needs to go do what he's never done before. What's that? Go to the CFL and win a Grey Cup. Perfect. <laughs> go, if Tom Brady goes to the CFL, I'm all the way in. <laughs> I'm with that. Dude, the ratings would go up on that. That Or or maybe the USFL. That's what I, I was Ooh. just going there. How Ooh. deep are the Rock's pockets? Can Ooh. the Rock get Tom Brady I mean, to come? He ain't, and he not getting paid much to be a playoff quarterback anyway, Bert. You're only paid on the TV money anyway, so it's equivalent to a USFL. Or is it UFL now? Like, that's what, Bert, hey. The CFL and UFL, I'm here for. Make him, make him do both. Make the call, baby. <laughs> make him do both. Give me both and wins. <laughs> Definitely go. Make you put two goats on call. the same. Damn. All right, coming up next on Ramon, Kayla, and Will, Will, we're switching gears a little bit. We'll go back to some Vols talk. We got the spring game coming up on Saturday. What can we expect to see out of that? Brent Hubbs, our guy from VolQuest, joining us next on RK Dub here on 104.5 The Zone. I feel like I've been teasing this for the last several days, but it is going to be nice today. I think the rain is is out of the way, at least for the weekend. So you might have stuff to do. And maybe one of those things that you want to uh, get your checklist and check it off is spring cleaning. And part of spring cleaning is opening up those windows, making sure that they are opening properly. Because if you do see any cracks, any leaks, or they won't, stay open or just open in general, it's probably time to just dive in and realize you probably need new windows from our friends at Window Nation. And Window Nation, as always, has a great deal going on. You can buy two windows, get two free, plus uh, a little bonus here, zero down, zero interest, and zero payments for a whole 24 months. Pretty good deal. It is a pretty good deal. What's even better, Kayla, is all they do is windows. They are experts at that, okay? You never have to worry about you having issues with them because they've installed over 200,000 windows last year. That's 40 times more than the average window company with 96% of them requiring no follow-up service. And that's because they measure each window three times to ensure proper fit. And if you don't believe that, they got over 20,000 online positive positive reviews. And again, as Kayla just told you, the windows, I mean, they have a price tag to them. So why not buy two windows, get two free, and pay nothing with no interest for two four years reach out to them at 866 nation or go online at windownation.com This is your off-the-track racing report, brought to you by State Water Feeders. Can Byron go back-to-back? The NASCAR Cup Series heads to Texas Motor Speedway this weekend as William Byron looks to win in consecutive weeks after earning a victory last weekend in Martinsville. The season is only eight races long so far, but Byron has already picked up three victories, including the Daytona 500. However, the series goes from the short track of Martinsville to a mile and a half challenge in Texas. Byron has performed well at those size tracks, but Texas has boasted different winners in each of the last seven races there. Sunday also marks the first spring cup race at the track since 2019. The Auto Trader Echo Park Automotive 400 is set for a 2 p.m. Central start on FS1. This has been your Off the Track Racing Report, brought to you by State Water Heaters. I'm Liz Allison. If there's anything that I don't like, it's not having enough hot water. That was me way too often until I switched to a state brand tankless water heater. Not only do I never run out of hot water, but I'm saving on my utility bill every month. State Water Heaters makes gas and electric, standard efficiency to high efficiency water heaters, and of course, my personal favorite, tankless water heaters, where the hot water never runs out. Visit statewaterheaters.com and click on the Find a Local Installer link on the main page, and you'll be on your way to owning your very own state brand water heater, just like me.
Welcome back into Ramon, Kayla, and Will on this Friday morning. Hopefully all of you guys are enjoying that, having a good ride to work. Or if you're off, hopefully you can enjoy the day as well. Getting you jump started here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Our good friend Brent Hubs of VolQuest joining us in just a second. But Ooh, wow. um, Ramon, you saw the news about Jonas Adu yeah, um, hitting the transfer portal. Did. What were your portal. thoughts on that? Shocked. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'll say this. I remember Ron coming on our show and uh, on 3HL also just giving some feedback about, you know, how you could tell, like, in, in the in the uh, lead Eight and in the, in the tournament in general, uh, that Sweet 16 and Elite Eight round when when Adu couldn't get the offense going. He had to be pulled out for Estrella and for Toby Walker, who's also in the portal. Portal, um, yeah. That he, he said he was saying in Detroit, like, hey, be, be, y'all be cool. Like, don't boo him. Don't talk too bad about him because you could see it in Adu's face that he was somewhat lost and probably wanted a way out. And I thought that was super unique, man. Basketball is super intimate because you're indoors. You can hear the fans. And fans gonna fan out. You never tell a fan how to be a fan, right? Uh, When they buy their ticket and, you know, their hard-earned money and stuff like that is spent. And Adu got a lot of flack. Adu probably felt a certain type of way. And I can also see a situation where Adu probably wants more offense. You know, he probably wants to be involved a little bit more. And uh, nobody just wants to be a big rebound, pass it out to other folks like, there's that's it's a different game right now, so it's a lot of stuff I'm sure that goes into it. And I mean, just like most folks, most players who have the opportunity to make NIL, you're probably gonna go there uh, that route if you know you have more money in other places. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that with our good friend Brent Hubs joining us on this Friday morning, like he always does. Uh, obviously, doing some great work at VolQuest. How you doing, Brent? I'm doing great. Hope you guys are good this morning. We are, and we were just talking about uh, just the news, the the recent news with Tennessee basketball and Jonas Adu entering the NCAA transfer portal and will go through the NBA draft process as well. Brent, what were your thoughts on that? Well, the draft process was always going to be there. He was always going to do that. I think Tennessee felt like um, he was going to be back. I think they had already had some um, discussions with him about NIL um, before the season ended. I think they felt like they were in pretty good shape there. and um, I think they were surprised by this. I think that some people around Jonas, um, you know, w- were talking to him a great deal about, you know, whether he should stay or whether he should look around and, and go somewhere else. Um, some of those same people had this, a similar conversation with him a year ago. Uh, when it was rumored he might go in the portal, he ultimately decided to stay. Uh, but I think Ramon hit it on the head. I mean, I, I think this is there's multiple variables here as to why he's looking at this. I think part of it is some people around him are saying, "Hey, you've got to you've got to broaden your offensive game uh, if you're going to be a, a guy who can make it in the NBA. You've got to have the freedoms to do that." Um, I, I don't think this coaching staff would have ever blocked him from doing that if he could consistently show on the practice floor that he could make perimeter jump shots and do those types of things. Uh, but, you know, I think NIL, I, I think, you know, feeling the love. I, I think, you know, he obviously did not play well in the second half against Creighton. I didn't play very much at all in the second half against Creighton as they went with Tobey Awaka. And then uh, we all know what happened in the in the Purdue game. Um, in, the, in the Elite Eight. So um, this is the world we're living in right now. Uh, as a coach, not at Tennessee, but another coach told me, yeah, you feel pretty good about it you know, when you go to bed, but you also understand you could wake up the next morning and not have a basketball team to coach uh, because you might have four, three or four guys go in the portal. I mean, it's the movement in basketball is so significant right now um, that, that, that the transfer portal in basketball in the spring – exceeds the transfer portal in football but in terms of impact because one you're dealing with a fewer number of players and two more established players in basketball are more willing to move around um than than in some cases with football because in football you've got to go learn a new system you know there's a lot of things involved there with basketball i mean you go play ball right i mean um, and, and so, I, and I think these guys are, are more willing to move around than, than they are in, in football in some cases. And, and I think the movement, I don't know that it's done at Tennessee. Um, and, and I certainly don't think it's done around the country right now. 
Yeah, it, it is crazy. I mean, seeing some of these big names, too, um, with successful programs jump into the transfer mm-hmm. portal. You're right. I mean, it's happening everywhere you look. So when it comes to Rick Barnes and this coaching staff and, and the moves um, to follow to build their roster back up, what do you see them doing and, and where do they need to be the most aggressive? Well, I mean, they've got to have scoring. Um, you've got to go get a post player now. I mean, the question is, the you know, does Tobey Awaka entertain any thoughts of coming back to Tennessee? Because the biggest reason he left was he wanted more minutes. Well, the minutes are available for sure now with Jonas Adu gone. So does he entertain the possibility of coming back? I, I, I don't know. I, I think Tennessee would welcome him back. Uh, for sure. Uh, but you've got to go get a big man, which you didn't expect. You've got to go get perimeter shooting uh, and a wing score, which you knew that you were going to have to get. Um, you need to go get a backup point guard. Um, and, and, you know, you may need to go get more depending on what happens, um, you know, if there's any more movement there. And you're in a full scramble to do it because it's a race right now to get guys on campus to see, you know, if they fit and, and make decisions. So, it's a full-blown scramble. I mean, Tennessee's going to have two uh, visitors in town this weekend. The Belmont transfer, Cade Tyson, is supposed to be here for a visit. And the transfer from Hostra, who's a wing player, Darlington Dunbar, um, is, or Dubar is supposed to be here for an official visit. And, and those two things may go fast, right? I mean, you you got you can get them in for official visit. You've got to decide, you know, by the end of this weekend, or by taking these guys, or do I go scramble to get somebody else in town? It's one thing to go look for a, a transfer or two. It's a different thing to go look for five transfers. <laughs> um, and, and that's that's what Tennessee's looking at right now. It's a very different mindset. And you just wonder for some of the veteran coaches in the world how much longer they want to deal with this kind of chaos. You, you kind of saw it in the quotes from Tom Izzo yesterday. You know, I, I love to coach the game, but I don't like where the game is right now. Um, How much longer does he want to do it? I mean, Jay Wright's not the oldest guy in the world. He got out. I mean, he got out because he didn't want to fool with it. So did Roy Williams, and so did Mike Krzyzewski. And, you know, how much longer does some of these veteran coaches want to do that? I don't think Rick Barnes is going anywhere at this point. Uh, But it's got to be a frustrating feeling for a coach because you you, you make a run to the Elite Eight, and you're trying to catch your breath afterwards, and you don't even got to do a little portal work. And then you get surprised and have to do a lot more portal work than you originally expected. No doubt about it, Hubs. I got to ask you real quick before I segue into another question. Have you gotten a lot of 859 area codes uh, calling you? That's Lexington, if you didn't know. I'm trying to get a little support, <laughs> how how they navigate this type of coaching search stuff. Have you gotten that? <laughs> no. The, the, you know, those poor people. Um, it, it's one of those things where, again, I think the realities of, of – the coaching search world in, in all seriousness is in basketball in particular, people aren't just lining up to run to a blue blood program like they would 15 years ago because mid major quote, mid major money has gotten there. Uh, you can win it at any different school. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, the thought that I have just as easy of a chance to win a national title at Baylor as I do at Kentucky was the most con was the most foreign thought in the world, right? Like, like, there's no way you got an easier path to winning a title uh, at Baylor than you do at Kentucky. But the reality is you do. You know, the same way the reality is UConn's a better job than Kentucky is right now. I mean, they're paying comparable money. They've won more titles. They have an easier regular season path. Um, you don't have near the pressure in stores Connecticut as you do in Lexington, Kentucky. From a lifestyle standpoint, Connecticut's a better job. Yeah. And that's not what anybody wants to hear in Lexington. But, you know, the the thought process when it's your school is you say, man, the whole world's lining up to come to, to, to come to coach at my place. Because, I mean, we have the greatest history. We're a blue blood. We've got that. No, that's not necessarily the case. You know, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think that there was a waiting list for Danny White to interview for the lady ball job. I, I don't I don't think every, you know, established power five coach in the country, not named Kim Mulkey, Don Staley and Gino Ariama were calling the Parker search firm going, hey, what time's my interview? <laughs> you know, I, I want to go today. Can I get in right now? I mean, I, you know, I, I think coaches are in that sport in particular. They're just you know, they're comfortable where they are because you can win it from a lot of different places. You can't do that in football, right? You you can't compare UConn football 
to Clemson football or Tennessee football and say, yeah, we could we can get to the playoffs at UConn the same way we can at Tennessee. Absolutely you can't. And the money's not even comparable. It is a basketball. It's a different sport. It is, Hub. I feel like we need to sit down and have a whole podcast. You just text me whenever you're ready, okay? And we I'm can ready, talk. buddy. I'm ready. We, you don't have to get a hold of me, buddy. We can talk about this one, man. In, the, in that same sentiment, uh, Hubs, uh, Kim Caldwell, man, what, what have you learned about her this first week that she's been in Knoxville? What, speaking of new hires for the Lady Vols. Well, I think I think Confident has a brand. She's going to stick to her, her, her guns, so to speak, on how she's going to play the game, up-tempo, pressure. The challenge for her now is to put a roster together that can do what she wants to do. Athletically, the roster she's inheriting is going to have a hard time playing her style of basketball. That's why she you're not going to see her hanging around spring games and doing a bunch of interviews. And I mean, she's done that. She knocked that out of the park, checked that off the list, and now it's time to go build a roster. And there's a lot of females going in, a lot of women's basketball players going in the portal, big-name players, good players around the country. And uh, she's out beating the bushes trying to put a roster together because she's got to have a real impact in the portal uh, to, to get a team together to play her style of basketball. Yep. And uh, speaking of uh, the, the recruiting and spring games and stuff, we have the spring game this weekend, Hubs. What will we see on the field from this football team uh, as they kind of button up the spring so far? Well, you played a part of these things. You remember what the <laughs> spring game was. The, the scrimmage the week prior to, from a player standpoint, was a much more was a much bigger deal than the actual spring game itself. Um, and, you know, it's going to be generic. You're not going to see a ton of exotic defensive looks. These things are all on TV now. Coaches don't like to show anybody anything in the college game. I mean, just you know, you, we go to practice and you, there's you can't take pictures and video at times of mesh point drills like we haven't seen a mesh in in this offense in the last three years but that's just the way coaches are so it'd be pretty generic it's about individuals um i don't think you're gonna see a ton of nico i think dylan sampson probably gets a series and you shut him down but it is a big day for deshaun bishop at backup running back and khalif keith um at, at running back because this coaching staff's trying to figure out are we good enough at running back until cam selden gets back from injury and Peyton Lewis is up to speed, that we're okay, or do we feel like we need to take a running back in the portal when it opens up on Monday? Um, you know, do we need to start looking there? Th- this this whole week of practice, the last two weeks of practice, have been really important to try to decide that as a coaching staff. I don't know what they're going to do yet, but it is a big day for those guys and for some other young players, young offensive linemen that are going to get a ton of reps. I mean, Max Anderson, Gage Ginther, uh, Aiden Bussell, all these guys, Vice and Lane, guys who haven't played a bunch, they're going to get to line up and they're going to get to scrimmage, you know, 70, 80 snaps, whatever the number ends up being, against quality defensive linemen, and they can't get enough of those snaps right now. They just can't. So for those individuals, it's important. Big picture, I don't think you're going to walk out of that stadium or, or turn the TV off and go, okay, we are this or we are that. I don't think it's going to be a clear snapshot of what your football team is going to look like in the fall. Brent Hubs of AllQuest always joining us at this time here on RK Dub. When it comes to the defense in this game, particularly the secondary, Brent, what can we expect to see uh, from who will play, and what have we seen out of them this spring up to this point? Well, they're more athletic, Kayla. I mean, they're a lot more athletic. They're just inexperienced. They don't have as much experience. So uh, every rep that those guys get to gain some experience is important as an individual. Ricky Gibson needs as much work as he can get. Uh, Jacoby Thomas has, has done well as a transfer in from MTSU, but he's still learning this system. So just simple things like getting guys lined up, getting the right call, all that stuff. Anytime you can do that in the stadium in front of a crowd with the coaches on the sideline instead of behind you or beside you or running out between you know series or running out between plays to tell you something is a good thing. So for them, it's just about stacking reps on top of reps, the closest you can simulate to game reps. I, I think McCoy is going to be one starter at corner. Gibson's going to be the other. I like what Turntine, Andre Turntine's done at safety, along with Jacoby Thomas and, and in Jordan Thomas at, at nickel or at star. Uh, I think Boo Carter is going to be a guy that everybody's going to be talking about coming out of spring because of his athletic ability. It's going to show up. He'll get plenty of work there. And then probably their third safety right now is the walk-on Will Brooks, who this coaching staff has a lot of belief in. Speaking of uh, Boo Carter and just in terms of maybe some special teams play too, could we see that? 
Yeah, but they won't tackle each other. Yeah. I mean, it'll be it, it'll be catch it, and he'll run a 40-yard dash <laughs> in, in wide open ground. And everybody will go, man, he's fast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, or, or they may run down, and, and he can make it look like that. But they're not going to tackle anybody in special teams. But the, the one thing we know about Josh Heupel and Mike Eckler is that they are not afraid to play a young player in a prominent role as a returner in special teams. Think about this. I mean, D. Williams was pretty good. But you got to go back two years ago. His first ever punt return was in Tiger Stadium against LSU. Now I know it was a noon game, and and you know they were still bowling their their gumbo out, outside, and they weren't <laughs> all in the stadium yet when it happened. But I don't care where you're at. I mean, you're you didn't give him his first return in a blowout game against a non-conference team. You said, hey, go make a play against the SEC team in an important football game. We trust you, and we believe in you. That's a lot of trust for a coach to put in there, right, Ramon? I mean, yeah. how many times you get, we got to wait till he's ready. He's got to prove him. Oh, well, you're good. Let's go. Uh, so I don't think they have any reservations about putting Boo Carter back there to be their punt returner. Now, Squirrel White will probably, you know, be the guy that they talk about and, and a guy that returns punts and, and could be the guy early in the year. We'll see if, if Carter takes over. But I don't think they're afraid of Carter because he's a freshman. I will say this. If Squirrel White's the punt returner, says a lot about what they believe they have at the slot receiver position behind Squirrel White. If you're, if you're willing to put the risk of putting him back there as a punt returner, um, you know, for potential injury, that means you feel confident about where Mike Matthews is and about where Braylon Staley is, the two freshmen who are playing slot behind him. Uh, on the way out, a couple of players I want to ask you about. Sure. Javante Spragans, one, because last year he had some articles come out to say he could be projected as a high-round guy and came back, didn't have a great year. So him and also one of the most improved guys I saw you write up was Jeremiah T. Lander. Heard about him since last year, man. What are those two guys' springs look like as far as Spragans and T. Lander? Well, let's start with Spragans. He's not done anything. Coming off that knee injury, he's rehabbed. He's not gone through anything this spring. Uh, He needs to have a better fall. He did not have a great fall last year, as you mentioned. I think one of the things that will hurt him ultimately at the draft is his reach at the guard position. He doesn't have the longest arms. I think he's got to have a good year on tape of of really finishing some blocks because people are going to kind of wonder if he's got enough length inside as a guard. I know you don't have to have the same length at guard as you do at tackle, but you you don't really need to have a – you know stubby arms either so (laughs) i think some people wonder a little bit about his length inside um he needs to have a solid year missing springs not a huge deal mentally because he knows what to do he's just physically got to get back to 100 percent jeremiah t landers had a great spring I, i think you could argue he's you know the most improved player on the defensive side of the ball and i think it's just because of experience and learning uh he's a football junkie he's learning both linebacker positions inside and outside and uh, he and William Inns, the new linebackers coach, have hit it off real well. Jeremiah's dad was a Division One defensive football coach at one point um, and, and, and has coached at small college and has coached in high school. And, and so Jeremiah's grown up around it his entire life. He, he's just kind of a football junkie, um, whether it's practicing physically, whether it's watching film. He's just kind of one of those, one of those guys, yeah. a little bit of a gym rat, if you will, and I think that allowed him to get on the field early. Uh, and I've had some conversations with his dad. And, and Ramon, his dad is, in a good way, but is as hard on his son as he as, as you can imagine an old football coach could be. I mean, he's pretty critical of him. Um, you know, they have very candid conversations about shortcomings, about what he's doing well. And I think that's helped Jeremiah's development as a high school player and then now obviously in college. I think he's made a really nice step from year one to year two. I think he's had a terrific spring. That's good. Brent Hubs, we always appreciate you giving us some good stuff. Enjoy the spring game uh, this weekend, the orange and white game, and hopefully we'll have some good stuff. I can't believe that. 33rd consecutive. (laughs) Can you guys believe Brent's been covering this since he was two? Ramon Look didn't want to do three consecutive as a player, did you, Ramon? I did, man. I mean, <laughs> no, you didn't. I mean hey, 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 Hubs. All I wanted to do was make it out safe to go to the par- after party, okay? That's all I was uh-huh. looking forward to. Make it out healthy. I don't want a summer surgery, and let's go party. That's all me and those, those hooligans wanted to do. <laughs> you and a hundred of your friends had the same vibe yeah. that last Saturday of the spring, didn't you? Sure did. Hey, are we good on this play? Yes, we are good. <laughs> we have Appreciate you, Brent.
Thanks. Y'all have a great weekend. You Appreciate too. it, Hubs. <laughs> Always good stuff from Hubs. Uh, yeah, 33 years of covering that. That's great. You say he's he been covering since he was two, Bert? Because there's no way he's a day over See? 30. There's no way he's a day over 35. Yeah, Bert knows how to butter up our guests. Come on now. He's a pro here. Coming up next on RK Dub, uh, some new details on how the Calvin Ridley deal went down that gives us even more proof that Rand is truly cooking. That's coming up next on RK Dub, 104.5 The Zone. Dickensupply.com, that's where you go if you want to go where the pros go. Of course, you want to do that. Dickens Turf and Landscape Supply. Will Bowling here with, with my friend Trey Hartsook. And Trey, springtime is here. The weather is heating up, and it's time to get outside and take care of those lawns, isn't it? Hey, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what else here. A lot of weeds, right? You're driving through, and maybe you've worked really hard this winter. You put down your prayer emergence on time, and you've got those pesky dandelions. Maybe you've got some clover popping up, a little chickweed. Hey, those guys are not our friends. We want to get them out of the lawn as soon as possible. So don't just accept the weeds. Don't just say, hey, these things are going to be a part of my lawn. We don't want them in there. We can get them taken care of for you. Stop in and see if you got a mystery weed. Maybe you don't know what it is. At Dick and Surf and Landscape Supply, we have lawn experts at every single location that would love to talk to you about how to get your lawn in tip-top shape. So if you can locate all of Middle Tennessee, got locations in Nashville, Hendersonville, Murfreesboro, Bellevue, Brewer Lumber, Mount Julia, and Franklin. If you can't get a hold of us, check us out online, dickensupply.com.
The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all cash offer. You close in as little as 21 days. No home inspections, no lock boxes, no open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing. Well, we're definitely cooking on this Friday morning here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. I don't know if we're cooking as much as Rand Carthon, though. General manager for the Tennessee Titans. Like, he's been making meals. Yes, he has. I think we're just making some side dishes here. (laughs) Hopefully, we'll turn those into some uh, feasts. But speaking of Rand Carthon, found it interesting yesterday Jordan Schultz uh, of the Shorts Report, I can't talk this morning, put out a tweet. He was on the Colin Cowherd show, and they were talking about just what the ad of Calvin Ridley will do for the young Will Will Levis. And we we spoke a little bit about Will Levis and some of the additions that have been made for him. And this is a big one, obviously. And then he went into a little bit of a side detail of how the deal really went down. And this is what he said. Someone in that building told me that Will Levis carries himself with a certain swag of a marquee franchise quarterback. Then they go out and get Calvin Ridley. Now, there's a little quick side story here of how that happened. Jacksonville thought they were getting him back. New England thought Jacksonville was getting him back. We know he wanted to stay in the South. At the final hour, Tennessee comes in after missing out on a couple guys the day before, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. They weren't able to acquire them. They pivot. They go to the wide receiver, Calvin Ridley, and he's still thinking Jags, who offered, by the way, dollar for dollar, exactly what the Titans offered. Rand Carthon, the GM of the Titans, gets on a FaceTime with Calvin Ridley, and he says, we're both from Florida. You're going to love the way we treat you inside this building. Halfway through the conversation, Ridley says, no, no more. I'm in. That's the difference maker. And I think Brian Callahan benefits in a big way. Someone in that building told me. Dang. Okay, Rand. So Rand's like, we don't care if we're the Tennessee Titans and people don't want to give us respect. Like we're starting to build something here and players are buying in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the exact same story I heard. Too. Dang. So the exact same contract offered. And Ridley's like, yeah, I'm good, Jacksonville. Yeah. I'm going to check it out in Nashville. Yeah. I said um, the conversation was, of course, Calvin. And I somewhat mentioned it yesterday before we this actually came up. Yeah. It was like, Calvin really said, I need to be the best version of myself. And my best version of myself is y'all just let me play and give me the balls and all those types of things. And that's exactly how I heard it somewhat played out. Exactly. Who? So whoever he's talking to has it very much uh, exactly as that lines up right there. And again, when they mentioned, and we laughed about it, the collaboration words and all those types of stuff that came up, though, okay, Liz, sounds funny until you actually realize that that stuff does matter and relationships do matter and reputation does matter also. And I know, again, all of this is awesome in the all season before everything gets kick-started. Right. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you can attract a player like Calvin Ridley, who was set to go back to Florida. And again, we're not talking about a difference in pay. We're talking about the tax free free state in Florida, tax free state. Like it lines up identically to where it was more comfortable for Calvin Ridley to stay in in, in, uh, in Jacksonville. Where he knows his quarterback, too, and where it's not even an unproven quarterback in Trevor Lawrence. And he's still like, yeah, I want to go up there. It was uh, it was a conversation. Like I said, the Florida connection conversation was a big part of it also. Uh, but it wasn't just him. Um, from my understanding, the, the Snead conversation was like that. Uh, when it all came together and how it turned into a, a bigger, like, oh, this is real. Uh, so that that type of stuff is, is, is fascinating, man. It's going to be interesting to see how down the line, Kayla, this develops and, you know, turns this team organically yes. into a, a, a high competitor year in and year out. I think that's the biggest thing. How fast can we see a rebuild happen now that you're seeing the moves like this, the the type of respect that the Titans are getting with general manager Rand Carth on there, now Brian Callahan. So um, it could unfold quicker than maybe other people think. Two hours done. Two more to go here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. We promise we'll keep cooking up some good stuff for you this morning. 
Coming up, we will talk about maybe a Titans need that you didn't think about in this year's NFL draft. No, it's not wide receiver. No, it's not inside linebacker. We'll get to that coming up on RK Dub here on 104.5 The Zone. It's Ramon Foster for Secure Lawn. Here to tell you, man, I don't care where you stay in the middle of Tennessee, they will get to you. If you have some lawn maintenance that needs to be done, as far as the weeds, as far as making it greener, as far as being able to keep your shrubbery together and, and growing and well together, well, guess what? Secure Lawn is the company for you. No, they will not take away from the person that cuts your yard. They will make sure your yard is better for the people who cut it. Also, uh, one thing I love about them is this, though. They've been here for over 20 years in the mid-state, all right? No, and they're not selling to the big companies who are buying out a lot of the companies around here also. So you don't have to worry about contract, contract changes, quality changes, your tech changes, none of those things, all right? When you get Secure Lawn... If you go to the website at Secure Lawn, you're able to talk to somebody on their website or simply call them also at 615-893-8455 to get them over to your house to spray some of their awesome sauce on the, those pesky weeds so you can have the best lawn in your neighborhood. Again, Secure Lawn, call them at 615-893-8455 or go to securelawn.com.
What's going on? Happy Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Pete Thamel reporting in the dark of night that Kentucky is finalizing a five-year deal to make BYU coach Mark Pope the school's next head coach. Pope was a had a good record at BYU, 110 and 51, including 66 and 12 at the Marriott Center during his five-year tenure at BYU. Some NFL signings yesterday, more than usual, this close to the draft. The Eagles bringing in former Bengal and Jet C.J. Uzama. The Giants bringing in defensive tackle Jordan Phillips, 49ers, bolstering their secondary signing cornerback Rocky Yassine, and Jets re-signing safety Ashton Davis. And less than two weeks away from the draft, we have a list of first-round prospects who will attend the draft in person, and it is a no- noticeably shorter list than usual uh, with the quarterbacks, obviously, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and the wide receivers, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Rome Adunze. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Happy Friday. Welcome in to this edition of Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Always brewed up by our friends at 8th and Roast. They've got locations all over Middle Tennessee, 8th Avenue, Charlotte, Midtown. They've got two in the airport. Of course, you can always find your favorite retail bag, Kroger, Publix, Whole Foods. They're all over the place. They're even on Uber Eats now. So Uh, you can get it to you quickly, wherever you want. And we have a fun show this morning. We've been having a lot of fun. We've got Ramon Foster here. He always is cracking the jokes. Every once in a while. I'm I'm, I'm off as funny is what I am. I'm off as funny. Don't put me in front of us. funny? Yeah, don't put me on the stage. Don't put you on the stage. That's what I was going to say. Okay, so don't go to Zany's. You're not going to see him at Zany's. Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, no. Now, Robert Walsh, on the other hand, I could see him doing a... uh, a little set at Zany's. Got, got a routine. Yeah. I guarantee he's got Would a you ever do that? Would you ever do the stand-up thing? What, like I'm a clown? Like I amuse you? <laughs> <laughs> like I make jokes <laughs> for your amusement? <laughs> no, I would never do that. Honestly, I'm terrified because it, I feel like I'm situationally funny. If I stand up there and tell you a yeah. joke, I think I would flounder. Honestly, the people that can pull that off are, are extremely talented. All the respect to the stand-up comedians and the sit-down comedians. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't think I could ever do that. Like, yeah. I give so much props to uh, the people over there. I was just thinking about when my friends come into town, uh, I was going to say, hey, let's go to a com- comedy show. So, think about doing that. Might checking, do that. Checking it out at Zany's. Yeah, so. No, the art of delivering yeah. jokes and storytelling, I, I think both of those things like are to be taken serious. Exactly. Like If, you, if you're going to captivate a crowd... You you definitely. That's one thing I've always said about the show. Like, I need to be able to make sure I, I get better at my storytelling. Mm-hmm. If I got a joke, I need to be able to land it whenever I need to. Because uh, it, it is an art, man. You got to take it serious, too. And those people do not joke around. No, they don't. They do, but they don't. I get what you're saying yeah, there. Yeah, you feel me. Okay, so we were talking a little bit about uh, the Masters earlier. Just wanted to give you an update. The first round is about to wrap up. Tiger Woods is now at even. He's at 16. So uh, okay. drop back one, but looks like he's he's still holding it together here. So he's still got plenty uh, more golf to play here as he starts his second round later today. We brought up the fact that Rand Carthon is obviously cooking. He's bringing some big players here. You've got Brian Callahan, who's an offensive-minded guy now and hopefully going to change the look of this offense for – the most important part of it, which is Will Levis. So we've talked about some of the wide receivers that they've added in Calvin Ridley. You've got D hop. Now you're maybe thinking they could go wide receiver somewhere in the draft, but I think a need that wasn't really thought of right away, just because they've done drafting with this position in the last couple of years is tight end. And you see last year, they, um, are able to draft 
and get a guy in here um, from Cincinnati. And then you see a guy in Chigaconqua the year before that from Maryland. And Chig was supposed to take the step this year. Josh Wiley was just a rookie. And we kind of saw some ups and downs with him because of injuries. And so I think when he was asked about tight ends during the presser earlier this week, we maybe didn't expect as much of an answer like this, but he said, we only have three tight ends right now. That's not what you're going to take into training camp. We certainly need to add more. Now you could look at this as depth as a thing that they have to have. And he mentioned we want at least five or six tight ends in training camp, but do the two tight ends that they have, do they fit what they're looking for? Can they do what they want them to do with this new offense? I think they're capable. I definitely think they are. I think you got two different side, two different styles of tight ends, too, to where Chig is a short, quick, down, you know, quick in space type of guy. And it seems like Wally, went, the role that he somewhat had last year was down the field, hitting the seam on the sideline, one-on-one with guys, using his size and his attributes that he was born with. So when you look at what they've done, I guess the biggest issue, Kayla, with them saying, yes, we need tight ends, one is for the competition to make it through training camp. He acknowledged we need five. You know, so you're still too short. But the other side of those two guys is this. They hadn't done a lot. We, we looked at, like you said last year, is Chig having the opportunity, whether it's injuries, drops, whatever the case may be. It's not the second-year jump that he wanted, right, last year or uh, in this past 23 season. And then Josh Wiley comes down the field. It was encouraging to hear Coach say he's added muscle. I thought about that, too. You know, and, and that is a part of this also, Kayla, is learning how to be a pro and that's adding muscle or, sh- or shedding weight either for dudes that need to. But for dudes like Josh Wiley who seem to – you know, take those bad hits and get hit injured and can't stay on the field, maybe it was training. Maybe it was, hey, you need to bulk up a little bit more so you can take these NFL hits. There was, There is an adjustment period. But when you look at who's available as far as veterans around the league, one name pops out, of course, is because his, his father's a legacy Titan himself, and it's Bryson Hopkins. He's available right. as a young free agent coming out. The tight end classes, as it pertains to the draft this year, I'm not sure if there's anybody that you want to reach for as far as saying, hey, we'll take this guy in the second round if you're looking for an immediate playmaker. Mm-hmm. You know, because as we get to, well, there's no third round pick as it stands right now. We're looking at four, fifth, six, seven round guys. What are you going to ask those guys to do? Are you looking for, hey, not just a tight end, but are you looking for a playmaker on special teams? You know, are you looking for that type of guy because the incorporation of the kickoff return and just because you need bodies too? So when we're asking this team, Coach Callahan and his offensive staff, when you mention you need tight ends, my question is, well, what kind of tight end are you looking for? Is it because, as I said a second ago, these two guys don't have a long rap sheet as far as the plays they've made in this league? And it's, it's, it's very scary sometimes going into a season not knowing what your playmakers are capable of. If you're asking Chig to be that guy, well, he had the opportunity last year. And because of drops, because of, you know, just the lack of the ball going to him, it is a big question mark. So I get it. I didn't expect him to say that, though, Kayla. It'd be like, we need tight ends. I didn't and it's, it's probably this, too. I think these coaches are doing a lot of coaching through the press to where they're saying this stuff out loud so that everybody hears it. So now the magnifying glass is on that group in that position. Mm-hmm. The pressure's on them to perform. They have to respond to what these coaches are saying in the public space right now because. As as much as we think we love Chig and we love what Josh Wiley is capable of, here's the other part behind that. They've got no Pro Bowls. they got no big-time plays. They have no big amount of yards as it pertains to their passing – I mean, pass-catching skills, right? And this offensive staff is new. Everybody is under the gun as far as performing for this group. They didn't select Josh Wiley. They didn't select no. Chig Conquo. Uh, right. I mean, same, ran ran. I guess technically was part of the Josh Wiley selection. But, but he's always said his yeah. job is to appease to the head right. coaches and the, you know, the offensive staff and what they want. Mm-hmm. So they were picked before him for the old coaching staff, right? Yeah. And the way you got to view this situation is is look, y'all got to go prove it to me. The same way that we probably question like, why did you sign Sadiq Charles? He hadn't played a whole lot, and you got a a million questions behind a guy like him. Well, you know what you have to say. Bill Callahan signed off exactly. on him. Brian Callahan signed off on him. And uh, Holtz, Coach Holtz signed off on these dudes, right? They didn't sign off on Chig or Josh Wiley. 
So it's fair, Kayla, to say we need tight end help, mm-hmm. right? Because, again, this is they're trying to compete. The FC South has gotten, on paper, stronger. Yeah, it is. At, at, at every team is doing their part. I mean, Houston is clearly the – Uh, out in front a little bit more than Jacksonville and the Colts right now. But the Tennessee Titans have also made some significant moves in trying to make this team better as fast as they can. And you're right. The the jury is still out on both of these tight ends. And I did like the fact that Josh Wiley has added some pounds. I believe he could be a guy you could use in certain situations. Look, I even look at the red zone situation with the Josh Wiley type. Um, you know, could we use him a little bit more in, in those types of situations? You're not going to have Derrick Henry anymore down there. And right. and hopefully you won't have to rely on, you know, you can, you can rely on maybe some other, you know, certain types of ways to, to, to yeah. get in the end zone too. It is. Um, but I, I look at that. And then with Chig, I, I truly do feel like he was in his own head at the start of last year because he did have so many high expectations moving into last season. I mean, you I would listen to fantasy football channels and it would be like, you better pick Chig up. Yeah. Chig's going to be one of those guys. And, and he, you know, he didn't necessarily live up to the hype last year. He played in all 17 games, but 54 receptions for 528 yards. I remember on this show, we were predict- predicting him maybe even to have – 800 yeah yeah and or what he kind of needed to have because there wasn't much of a uh in terms of skill players around will levis last year right uh so he definitely needs to take the jump and i think he can under this staff but you got to add depth i don't care how you do it there's guys out there you've got to bring in competition um it's it's a position that if anything is is gaining ground in the NFL like we're talking about yeah. some of these tight ends and how they affect the game so we'll see what they decide to do with that but even if you draft one late maybe that you see has that potential yeah. depending on your needs and, and that's the thing about it what are you asking the tight ends to do 400 yeah. to 800 yards is what you want out of that group right and mm-hmm. but it's got to be good and they also got to be an extension of the offensive line to being able do. to block it, Callahan said yeah. that too it's not just the offensive line that needs to have you know, protection on their mind. It's it's the other guys yep. around him. So should be interesting. And, and speaking of pass catchers, the one pass catcher I think that is being targeted the most in terms of what he needs to do next season is certainly Traylon Burks. So what does he have to do? And I think the biggest question is, can he shine under a new coaching staff that is kind of being known to develop players We'll talk about that. We'd love to get your opinions to 615-737-1045. Let's have that discussion next here on RK Dub 1045 the Zone. Nashville is such a great place to live. We have great sports, great entertainment, great restaurants, and we also have one of the top volume Ford dealers in the country right here in Middle Tennessee. That's Two Rivers Ford, if you didn't know. If you haven't checked out Two Rivers Ford lately, they've pretty much got something for everyone. If you're a business owner, Two Rivers Ford has a commercial fleet division, an entire team dedicated to getting your work trucks and vans for the best price and the best financing, and they deliver what you need quickly because they know time is money. And did you know that Two Rivers has a mobile experience division also yes it's 2024 and everything comes to you now well two rivers ford comes to you also if you need maintenance on your vehicles they'll perform basics basic maintenance like oil changes or new brakes right at your home or office or you can schedule a pickup and delivery service two rivers ford will come pick up your vehicle leave your loaner service your vehicle and bring it right back when it's ready and guess what all these mobile services options cost you they the exact same price you pay at the dealership. So when it comes to purchasing a vehicle also, to Rivers Ford team of experts, they have a team of experts for every type of vehicle. They have electric vehicle and hybrid experts, Bronco experts, work truck experts. You, you're always, you'll always be in excellent hands with Two Rivers Ford team. And in case you didn't know, the sales team at Two Rivers Ford doesn't work on commission. They're there to service you, answer your questions, bring a vehicle to your home or office test drive, whatever you need. They just want to make sure the experience is the best that it can be because there's a reason Two Rivers Ford has been around for over four decades. Two Rivers Ford, the South's most trusted Ford dealer.
Welcome back into RK Dub on this Friday morning. Good news, the sun is out. Let's go. Yeah. That just like makes my morning so much better when I see the sun peeking out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all, KK. Okay, Not at all. Well, hopefully the sun comes out for Traylon Burks. Oh, Kayla. Hopefully, um, you know, he can see a season on the field in terms of his health and just in terms of what he was projected to be, which might I remind everybody, John Robinson at the time, general manager of the Tennessee Titans, mm-hmm. traded uh, away A.J. Brown, Brown and traded up to get Traylon Burks. And Traylon Burks just has not been able to be that guy yet. And I remember talking with him the first week that he got here, and we all had our one-on-ones when I was with News 2, and the big question was, like, do you feel that pressure? Like, now that you have a guy like A.J. Brown gone and you're the number, you know, one pick for the Titans in that draft in terms of the first round, do you feel the pressure? And he said, no, I don't feel the pressure Like, I do me. I'm not going to compare myself. And I respect all of that. But the fact of the matter is it's not turned out to be that way, at least in the two seasons that he's played for the Titans. Let me just go over numbers really quick, and then I want to get your thoughts on this, Ramon. But in the first two seasons, he's played in 11 games. So 22 overall in two seasons. He, in the first season, 33 receptions, 444 yards, one touchdown in his rookie season. Last year, 11 games played, 16 receptions, 221 yards, zero TDs. Health has been a thing. Staying on the field has been a thing. And when you're not able to stay on the field, you're not able to build your game, period. So you can blame it on, you know, the coaching staff or the offense and all of this. But the only way we're going to see Traylon Burks succeed here is if he can stay on the field and take that jump. And let me remind you, Traylon Burks, who came from Arkansas, mainly played in the slot there. When he came over here, we didn't see that as much. Put him outside for the most part. They absolutely again, did. You, you asked him to play the role of who again? A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown. Yeah. However, when the Titans... Staff was asked about him specifically this week when Brian Callahan was talking about the slot positions. Traylon Burke's name was not brought up. And with two outside guys who you assume will be DeAndre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley, Ridley, where the hell does Traylon Burks land now in his role? Where does he land? Uh, Hopefully on the field for 17 games. Let's let's get there first, right? Let's let's make sure we get there first. And I think last year, last year he was on uh, the trajectory to do that, right? Kayla, with you know, he came back thinner. Look, no, he was in shape. You could tell he was in shape, and then the injury happened in um, in Minnesota in the preseason. Um, so so here's the thing though, too. And I said this yesterday on, on 3HL for the most part. Traylon's situation was botched to begin with. You know, at, in in a sense, not botched. But it seemed like the coach and the GM didn't agree with what was happening. Whether Vrabel wanted to keep AJ or not, or whether it was good business that they got rid of him, you ended up picking Traylon because there was, here we go, I'm going to say need. There was a need to go get a wide receiver. There was a need to go get a playmaker for this offense because you just lost AJ. I think if we can go back and do a poll on this one, how do you feel about this trade? I think it'll probably get an F from the fan base. Period, right, Kayla? That's where mm-hmm. you at on that one? Mm-hmm. Just listen to people talk about this. I think it's pretty much an F on how the fans feel about this because it's, it's netted you nothing. But when you look at the style of offense that's been here for the two years that Traylon's been here uh, as a Tennessee Titans, you know this. It's been Ron predominant. Yeah. It's been focused on Derek and the compliments around him, right? And that's why we're getting to this point now. It's where it was a hard change to be made, but it had to happen. And, and when you're asking somebody to come here – to be the, the you know the sideshow for everything, the sideshow to the run game, then it makes it problematic. That's why you got to go get veteran guys like you remember signing Julio and those types of dudes and Robert Woods and they, and such. Like Traylon's rookie year, y- you want to know? Oh, oh, this is gonna break some hearts right here. His his rookie year. Do you want to know what the passing game was 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 the highest well, leader? Share that with us. Um. Robert Woods yeah. was your leading receiver. Give us the numbers. 
527 yards. I'm sorry. That is the most laughable thing I've ever heard. Chick actually had a really good year. Yeah. 450 yards. And number three behind him, tied for third, was Traylon Burks with 444 yards and Austin Hooper yeah. for 444 yards. So saying all, I brought all that up to say this too. It's not like you had an air raid type in offense. Traylon getting here and getting hurt, coming out of shape, was one of the things, and and that wasn't, I only think, the biggest issue with Traylon. We talked about the transparency that this new coaching staff has has given this group, right? Has given the media, has given the fans, too. One of the things that, that happened with Traylon was perception. He was perceived to be out of shape, a big wide receiver that nobody gave grace to because nobody told us until it was way in camp, oh, we got an asthma problem. You remember? And that came out by Rob Moore, and I don't think it was supposed to come out by Rob Moore. I don't think Vrabel wanted to tell any of us. Kayla, he had an asthma problem. Yeah. So, okay, all right, so if we knew that, then we can address it and fix it, right? Sure, right but away. But, of course, fan perception was he was supposed to come in and be AJ. And, but when you also look at the fact of how Todd Downing, <laughs> Todd Downing ran that offense, you knew this. In hindsight now, it wasn't a greatly run offense, right? It wasn't efficient as you needed it to be. Your highest NFL wide receiver receiving yards was 527 yards, Kayla. Mm-hmm. 527 yards. All right, so we do that. Get rid of Todd Downing after the situation happened with him. And then you said you hire uh, Tim Kelly. No knock on Tim Kelly whatsoever at all. But he was in a position to where you inherited a good bit of this uh, offense and you got to run it through Derek again. And then, of course, Traylon gets injured. And then, of course, after the injury, he comes back, and then he gets knocked out again. So as much as I want to pile on him and say, hey, man, this is a messed up situation, he's also had it somewhat stacked against him also. Again, it's, not, it's, it's only so many times you have a guy come into position and immediately feel the shoes of, of, of an entity like an A.J. Brown. Sure. It was a lot to ask of a guy. And before we take a call, see, so we have a call on the line here. It's this, too. Um, so you're asking yourself, Kelly, you saying Nick Holtz uh, didn't and he didn't bring up um, Brian Callahan didn't Brian bring Callahan him up. Yeah, didn't bring up Traylon when he started when talking about, about the, the slot. slot. And so the slot would probably be the third wide receiver. So I went back and looked at um, in recent history, 21, uh, 22, and 23 season that mm-hmm. Brian Callahan has been in Cincinnati and the, the results of the number one, two, and three wide receiver. And I think when we look at the parallels of how Tennessee has operated, Tennessee Titans have operated as far as offense in the passing game, I think you can at least say if we get this out of trailing, boy, that is a win because the number one guy in 2021, I think that was the year they ended up going to the Super Bowl, uh, the number the number one, two, and three wide receivers were Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd. I even throw the tight end. At 21, Jamar Chase had 1,400 yards, over 1,400 yards. T. Higgins, the number two, 1,091. And then number three for them, he's 27 years old at the time, was uh, Tyler Boyd, 828 yards, five touchdowns. You'll take that with 67 Absolutely. receptions. And also, we're speaking of Chig and the tight ends, uh, C.J. Ozama had 493 yards. That was I'm a big season for that. him, yeah. So the number three for them is – 800 yards, Kalen, 21. The number three uh, receiver for them in year three was um, it was Tyler Boyd again, 762 yards. Of course, Jamar Chase got his for 1,000, and T. Higgins did too. So we're talking about 700 to 800 yards for number three. So let's even go to last year real, just real quick. Uh, injuries, I think, hit this group. Yes, it did. So Jamar Chase still got his as a number one, 12, over 1,200 yards. Tyler Boyd, a number three usually. Got his standard 600 yards right here. He got 667 yards. And even in the 12 games that T. Higgins played, he still accumulated 656 yards. So when we're asking what we need out of trailing this year, 600 to 800 yards would mm-hmm. be clutch for his career on top of having maybe five touchdowns. That's what we're asking because the pressure is off of him as much as it was in the beginning of his career. And, and after A.J. left, now what we need from you is about I'm going to give him floor, 700 yards from a number three. With this style of offense that we expect Brian Callahan to bring to Nashville. Let's hear what offensive coordinator Nick Holtz had to say about him when was asked about Traylon Burks on Wednesday. You know, Traylon's potential is, you know, very high. First round pick, obviously you can see all the talent, but he's going to get what he earns, you know what I mean? And, uh, He's, you know, Mike two days with him. He's been a great guy. He seems like he's learning a lot. He's really taking in process and all the information. And then when he gets on the field, that's what he can translate. But he's got a skill set that, you know, he's a big guy. He can run and he can make contested catches. And so 
If he can find a way to do that for us, that'd be a pretty big uh, addition. If he can, you know, if he can find a way to do that, that's telling. Because they're saying, look, we're going to give you the resources. We've got a new coach in Tyke Tolbert who has been really successful at that position in terms of a position coach at wide receiver. You have Will Levis, which, you know, Traylon Burks, let's let's be honest about this too, did not necessarily build any chemistry with last year. If anything, I think Kyle Phillips built more chemistry with Will Levis in his time playing than Traylon Burks did last year. So they're saying, look, we're putting it on you. You, You're going to be able to do what you want to do in terms of proving yourself. We've got a new uh, staff around you, strength and conditioning staff as well, to hopefully be able to keep you healthy. So you got to go do your thing. I think if anything, like this is a prove it year, period, for Traylon Burks. And I, I see a comment in FNM Bank chat that says, I get the differences. Uh, this is from AJ in FNM Bank chat. He goes, I get the differences, but AJ got his numbers and that anemic offense. Traylon was just a terrible pick is what our listeners are saying. It's like traded AJ and made an atrocious pick. Full stop. Let me stop you right there. AJ got his numbers because AJ was available. AJ first two years in the NFL with the Tennessee Titans. He played in all 16 games his rookie year, started 11, and then, and got over 1,000 yards. You're right. And then, of course, in his second year in 2020, played in 14 games, started 12, and got over 1,000 yards also. He was available. Mm-hmm. Traylon's availability is necessary. The one word I, I hated that, uh, that Callahan said in his description of Traylon was this, and our guy Ron Slay has a good guy board. He has good – you know what happens to good guys – Good guys get. I run know over. what happens to good guys. I, I, I'd much rather have heard Coach Callahan say, "Man, we, we we got a dog of a guy who's eager to work." He called him a great guy, and I was just like, "Dang!" And I look back at my 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 my, my guy Savage's whiteboard back here. He didn't put good. He didn't put trailing <laughs> up there under the good guys, man. So I'm gonna have to ask him how he felt about him calling him a great guy. Because when you talk about players, sometimes what you want the first things to say come out of a coach's mouth is, "Man, he's a hard worker." He's he a gets dog. It. He's a dog, man. He's a playmaker for us. Trey Lang's got a lot to prove. Mm-hmm. He does. But here's the thing. With Tyke Tobert being here, with the efficiency of what we think Brian Callahan and Coach Holtz can call an offense, with us knowing this also, the ball will be spread around. And if you got to focus in on Calvin, if you got to focus in on, on D-Hop, right, and if you got to focus in on Tony Pollard and also Tajay Spears, Trey Lang is there for the taking. So as many people want to pile on to him, and I agree, Traylon deserves it. In the NFL, either you do or you don't. Yeah. You're judged by simply this. No one's this. babying you. No, and, and here's the judgment too, Kayla. It's always been described to me as this. you either above the line or you below the line. And any, everything in the, in, in the middle, it handles itself. All right, you missed a block, gave up a sack. All right, you had a couple drops. But was the entire game above the line or below the line? That's what he. That's what we got to decide for Traylon coming up into this twenty four season. And you can only hear so many times. Well, he has a high ceiling. Well, he has potential. That's fine. But at some point, you got to reach it, or you're out the door. Right. And so Traylon has the opportunity to do it this year. And by the way, young fella, pick the brains of the two men that are in the room with you, and DeAndre Hopkins, and now Calvin Ridley. Pick the brains of those two men who have done it and done it successfully, yeah. and are in their thirties and still balling out, like, take advantage of the opportunity in that wide receiver room that you have. Spend the extra time to get it from the guys that have done it the best. Let's go out to Mike in Cleveland. What's up, Mike? What's up, Mike? (laughs) There it is. We love it. Yeah, scaring people on this rainy Friday. You should see the car in front of me. But yo, what's Be up, careful. Girl? What's up, Mike? I know it's Friday. It's a music drop day, man. I know you ain't got no content today, man. What was? So what I, else we got? I, I only, I only, uh, you know, promote my music when Will is there, <laughs> just, to, just to dig in the skin a little bit. So when he comes back, then, then I have a surprise for him. A little, 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 little nice <laughs> twist right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little one, just a little one. Well, yo, uh, no, nah, you know, I just wanted to call in about Traylon Burks and also about the receivers. But first, 
with trailer. Yo, Rand been whipping it up though. Rand, he doing his thug fizzle, and I've been I, I've been happy to see these moves. But yo, with Traylon Burks, I think outside the offensive line and uh, Levis, he is definitely the the most watched on this offense of returning players to uh, see if he gonna like y'all was just saying if he gonna make that jump. And I think really, you know, it's going the credit is gonna go to him, but also. It's gonna to go to coach. It's gonna to go to Callahan. If he can turn, if he can turn trailing around and make a non-believer like me, because I've been down on trailing. Y'all should already know. I've been like, why y'all still looking for this guy? If he can turn that around and, and make me be like, okay, let's go, Burks. And I see people with a, a, a Burks uh, jersey, and I don't laugh. Then okay, that go to coach Callahan. He did that. Uh, with the other stuff y'all was talking about, wide receivers and, and with the um, tight ends and stuff, it's refreshing. How many years have we been in the off season and we talked about receivers being good blockers? Mm. How many years, Mo, you touched on it, how many years – have we gone into the season looking at tight ends like, well, he can he can maybe come up with some big plays, but really what he got to do is block for this run game. And now we're talking about receivers stepping up, being receivers, but not only receivers, being playmakers in a new offense. So, you know, that's the bright side, baby, and it's refreshing to have this in the off season. So, you know, right now it's peaches and cream, and I ain't tripping. And, uh, yeah, man, <laughs> deuces. Much love. Deuces. Right. Much love, Michael. I love the throne of the peaches and cream. You remember that He's song, right. by the way? Yeah, I do, by 112. <laughs> yep. I do. Uh, Mike got a point, though. Where are actually at talking about them catching passes? Mm-hmm. Not blocking. And not blocking. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't even register. It's a new era. Trailer. Titans football, baby. But that's the demand for trailer. It is. And I like the, the, the point he brought up. If there is a jump in Traylon Burks' production, you put a lot of that also on the coaching staff because, again, we go back to this. That's what they brought in with this coaching staff. It was deliberately put together like this where they're putting guys at positions in terms of coaches that can help develop. Just because you make it to the NFL doesn't mean you're ready-made. There is still development that has to happen with a lot of these players, and there was a lack of that over the last few years. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I see James and FNM Bang Chat say, too, he says the bongos. I, yeah, your friend of my, you know, enemy mm-hmm. of my enemy is my friend, okay? Uh, but he says the bongos also have a quarterback, basically, too. And that's the other side of this also, Kayla and listeners, is that Will Levis still has to prove, too. He it's does. It's a new offense. It's a new style of, of, of ball that he's got to get used to, and they're going to cater to Will as much as they possibly can. But But – the point is this, though, James. You're not going into this 24 season th- saying how much can we run the ball for with this with running back A, and that's no dig at Derek. There's no dig at at anybody. It's just it's just the history as of late has been run, run, run. And I guess when you're asking to have talented wide receivers do their job, meaning catch the football, and they want to receive the ball too. Well, now at least from what the coaches have told us, until we see what this offense is going to look like. It's going to be a passing offense. History shows in Cincinnati, whether with Joe Burrow or Jake Browning, they're still going to throw the ball. And that's what we're looking for down here in Nashville. That, to me, whether it's Joe Burrow, Jake Browning, uh, whether it's Will Levis, Mason Rudolph, or, uh, or Malik Willis, the idea is you're going to throw the ball. And when it comes to receiving the ball, that's where you need trailing to step up. Mm-hmm. 615-737-1045. We can take your calls. What do you think? Is Traylon Burks, uh, can he shine under this new staff or is it going to be a wash? You can give us a call here now on 104.5 The Zone. It's Ramon, Kalen, Will.
Hey, it's Kayla Anderson with QC Kinetics. And did you know they are the future of medicine? That is right. If you're tired of achy joints, which I know I definitely am, uh, if your joint pain is keeping you from doing what you love to do, you can call QC Kinetics now. Surgery, steroids, drugs, that is no longer your only best options. Regenerative medicine at QC Kinetics is simply transforming lives with innovative treatments that deliver lasting results and everybody likes that. We're talking about natural biologics here, using your body's own power to repair and restore that damaged tissue. And QC Kinetics is under the leadership of National Medical Director Dr. Mitchell Sheinkup. And Sheinkup is a pioneer in this field in particular with 20 years of clinical work, tons of research, teaching, publishing, you name it, he has done it. So call QC Kinetics now to learn more about some exciting options and again, we're talking about long-term relief with no downtime. Call QC Kinetics for a free consultation, 615-249-4024. That's 615-249-4024.
Welcome back into RK Dove here on 104.5 The Zone on this beautiful Friday morning. Hopefully you all can enjoy it sometime today. We've been enjoying this convo about Traylon Burks and what he can do potentially this season. Mark in the borough joins us with his thoughts. What's up, Mark? Good morning, Mark. Good morning, y'all. Uh, y'all holding it down. Um, look, look, look. I would say that Traylon should get better because of Ridley and D Hop and less pressure on him. But also, um, how do you guys think practice will go with Sneed and Cheeto lining up on the opposite sides and giving them something to challenge them? They didn't have <laughs> anybody really to stay healthy at cornerback over the past couple of years to challenge our receivers during practice. So just want to see how, you know, we develop doing practice, you know, uh, with those weapons on the opposite side. Great question. That's an awesome question. What a different way to look at that, too, in terms of, hey, now that the defense has got some names, some different looks in the secondary, mm-hmm. because you're right, the secondary has been down the past couple of years. You got some dogs back there now, yeah. especially in Legereus Sneed in, in terms of what he's proven during his career. Um how can that make a guy like Traylon Burks battle in terms of camp? Because, look, he had a good training camp. He came in looking really good last year, but I don't care what you do in training camp if it doesn't translate on the field. But at the same time, he can take everything. Like, he's got to take everything seriously, and it does start in training camp with those type of battles. Yeah, so as as far as that, that question goes, too, is this. Uh, I've seen it go one or two ways. I've seen, uh, you know, I go on one side of the ball where a guy like Antonio Brown, right, was really good at right running, running and went every day at practice. And you have young DBs that cover him, and he crushes them. And you start to question yourself. So I've seen it go that way, but I've also seen, and I'm going to use just Antonio because he's really freaking good, okay? So it was always a challenge to make him better in practice. So when we traded for or we signed Joe Hayden, I remember watching those two battles, you know, and them those dudes go at each other and both got better. Both had uh, extended careers and played really well and stuff like that. Or it, it can go one or two ways. Either you step up to the competition and say, you got me today, I'm going to get you tomorrow. Or you have guys get crushed through competition. Now, I'd expect because of the, the level of talent surrounding trailing and the rest of the receivers too with Calvin, with, with D-Hop that's proven he can still get over 1,000 yards, is this. Everybody's going to get dragged to the finish line too. Is that element of, hey, you either with us or we're going to find somebody else that's just like us. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. so, again, to your question, was it Mark, I think, a second ago that call? Yeah. It can go one or the other ways. He can a, a player can get crushed because there's nothing you can do with him. And then you start questioning. Or, like I said a second ago, it's iron sharpens iron to where you may get me two days in a row and I'm going to come back and get you three days. And that's a good thing. I'm telling you, that's, that's a great problem to have. You'll probably hear – uh, people like Kayla who go to practice and say, man, I, you should have saw the passes uh, yeah. that were caught today. Like you'll probably see more stuff in practice than you do in the games because the competition raises up even more, man. It is a beautiful thing to have. Uh, I'm talking about a plethora of talent on your team. It really is. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that for sure. Um, there's been some questions in the FNM bait chat. Uh, AJ says, aren't there reports that he's already out of shape? That's a – yeah. You want it? Go for it because I'm not I, like that makes me a little bit angry. That was a steal picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it uh, <laughs> was that from somebody who actually reported and saw trailing, or was that somebody that had a visual of trailing through a video? Like, I he's not a big dude again, he may have some something on him, but I don't think he's out of shape. And again, here's the thing, too, we're gonna ask uh, AJ is this he's got five, six months to get in peak shape also, even if that is the case. And he understands how to balance his offseason. Now, I don't think he looks fluffy. Again, you can take any angle of anybody and say, man, you are large out here, okay? I'm not going to give trailing that because, again, they said he was in the building this entire offseason. He's been working and stuff like that. So it is what it is. I'm with Savage right now. That's Tom Foolery. That was yeah, Tom. I, I don't want to call this person, whoever it was, a blogger who put that out there. But anybody can catch a still image of anyone and make it look however they need it to. Let's wait until he's on the field to be making assumptions about yeah. that. I don't think that's fair at all. 
for him. Um, also, the other question really quick, how many concussions has he had? Two. Hmm. So that's also something where you got you got to be – he's wearing the thing around his neck yeah. now. Is he? Okay. Yeah, Good. so we'll see how that – Evolves, too, because you do not want to continue to to go through that in terms of the concussions. All right, coming up next, because we are three hours down. We got one more to go. So throw the fours up. It is the final hour of RK Dub. I want to ask you about this because it's been talked about that the NFL draft will have not many attendees this year, Ramon Foster, in Detroit. Are we seeing a different era of how the draft will be looked at in terms of those first rounders actually being at the draft? We'll discuss that. That's coming up next on RK Dub here on 1045 The Zone.
What's going on? Good morning. Happy Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Pete Thamel reporting late in the night last night. Kentucky is finalizing a five-year deal to make BYU coach Mark Pope the school's next head coach. Pope was 110-51, and 51, including a 66-12 and 12 record at the Marriott Center during his five-year tenure at BYU. Some uh, unconventional NFL signings before the draft, filling out the depth on people's roster, going into the draft with no needs. The Eagles bringing in tight end C.J. Uzama, former Bengal and Jet. Giants bringing in some defensive tackle help under Jordan Phillips. 49ers adding cornerback Rock Yassine and Jets re-signing safety Ashton Davis. Speaking of the draft, less than two weeks away, we have a final list, not a final list, the first list of first-round prospects who will attend the draft in person, a noticeably shorter list than usual with 13 prospects prospects notably the quarterbacks Caleb William Jaden Daniels Drake May and the wide receivers Marvin Harrison Jr. Malik Neighbors and Rome Adunze for all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs visit USSTN.com breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols this is 1045 it's Friday I can wait all day the zone Put those fours up. That is right. It is the final hour of RK Dub, and we are cooking. That's right. Starting your morning off right with the guy over here to my left. That's Ramon hey. Foster, VFL. And uh, spent a, quite a bit of time in the NFL as well. We've got Robert Walsh behind the glass. I'm Kayla Anderson. Will Bowling is out for the weekend, enjoying some sunshine and Destin. But we're glad that we have you all with us today. And as always, we are brought to you by and brewed up by 8th and Rose, locally owned and operated by lifelong friends turned business partners who design the local shops, which they have four of the locations around Middle Tennessee as a way to feel welcomed connected and part of the community. And I feel like our listeners feel a part of uh, a subject that has carried us a ways here today on Mm -hmm. RK Dub because the Traylon Burks conversation is definitely stirring up opinions and we always appreciate that. So let's go out to the phone lines and we've got Aubrey and Marilyn on Traylon. What's up? What's up, Aubrey? Hey, good morning, guys. Um, So I guess mine's more like a statement question. With, I don't understand how people keep writing trailing off. Like, he showed flashes. I mean, he has, of course, um, he's been hurt a lot, but he showed flashes, you know. My question is, do you think with the new coaching staff, it would help that um, they'll find a way to keep him on the field and keep him healthy? Yeah. Great Thanks, question. Aubrey. Thanks. For for me, is this the volume of passes that we expect to go up for this squad? I think is is it's fair to believe that Traylon will have an uptick in production if he shows he doesn't have butterfingers and can stay on the field. That is exactly what it is. I told you that the number three, who's been Tyler Boyd for Cincinnati for the last two, three years, three years at least since Jamar Chase has gotten there, he's averaged about seven, a minimum 700 yards a year when you average it up. He's had 667. He's had over 800. He's had over 700 yards the last three years. If you're telling me my number one and my number two can both get 1,000 yards and my number three – I let's for example maybe Traylon can get me at least 700 yards. That's a good year for Traylon Burks, considering he hasn't been on the field. And then you also look at him and say that again, whether they draft a receiver this draft or not, you at least know that you got a playmaker, pass catcher out of Traylon Burks that you didn't see in the last two years he's been here. And that's right now what the reality of the situation is. Look, he was drafted to to probably be a number one. The scenario they're in right now, you're looking at two other guys that are ahead of him that are 30 years old. And should be. And should be. Yeah. So you're right. He's has, He's got to work to not only be productive, but he's got to work his way back to even being a one or a two on this roster. Let's go out to Richard and, Sh- and Smyrna right now. He's got a question about Brock Bowers. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. Good, good morning. Hey, uh, that's he's been my favorite player. Now, I'm an Alabama fan. 
and uh, I told everybody when he graduated, I would throw a, a Brock Bowers uh, going away party just to get rid of him. Because this guy, uh, if you watch him play, averages 20 touchdowns. Guy can make one-handed catches, always gets open, big hands. In fact, he actually helped, almost single-handedly helped uh, Georgia beat Ohio State last season during that playoff game. If he hadn't made that catch inbounds with the uh, out-of-bounds and squeezed the thing, they would have been uh, – they would have – completed the drive and actually would not have probably gone to the national champion uh continued this guy is a beast six four he was a man coming in six four i think six four and a half two hundred and fifty pounds mm-hmm. i mean if they are if they are uh signing receivers i mean this guy can be uh, i thought they should be their first pick in fact when i show people that are titans fans their jaws dropped who is this guy i said brock bowers i said man go for him uh do you think it's a chance we could get him or would go for him or is that He's not an interest. Uh, Thanks, Richard. Thank Richard. He's definitely an interest. Mm-hmm. But it's a matter of do you pick a tight end in the top ten? I think Will is uh, giving us the stats like the the history shows top ten tight ends don't fare that well. And, again, if you're picking a tight end in the top ten, the role that you're asking him to play is to be a thousand-yard receiver also. I'm not sure if you want Brock Bowers to be the focus point of it. He needs to be a great tool, a great weapon, and will be for some team. I just don't know if you're in a position to be picking at seven. If you don't move back to take a Brock Bowers is where I stand on that one, Kayla. Again, now, if they move back to 12 and one or two of the tackles that you wanted is gone, the wide receiver's not there that you like, yes. I'm all in on Brock Bowers. I made that argument about two weeks ago, okay, mm-hmm. and by saying, look, I like the idea that you can go get a guy like him if you move back. That's where I am with him. Seven is too rich for Brock Bowers to me. Yeah, I'm with you on that point. But we've also heard the Indianapolis Colts tied to him and possibly going up to get a guy like that where you know he could be very beneficial to really anybody's offense. But they're looking for pieces, too, to help out a young quarterback in Anthony Richardson. Um, I'm with you though, Ramon. I, I think at seven, that that's too high for me to take Brock Bowers over even a Malik Neighbors or a Roma Dunze, oh, yeah. in my opinion. But if you trade back, maybe there is a scenario where he's there a little bit later and you can get him um, and you can get some more in terms of draft stock. Because again, I keep bringing this up, but I, I think it's such a big deal. Like no third round pick. I I can't get over that. Yeah. And maybe they find a way to get that done as well. Maybe. So, But, Richard, I'm with you. Yeah. I don't think you can count it out. No, you can't count it out. And I think I, I think as high of Brock Bowers as you do, Richard. But as far as his team's concerned, I don't know if you want to spend that number seven pick on a tight end like him. After 10, all right, now we start having a conversation. So, Brock Bowers will not be at the NFL draft in Detroit in a, in a couple of weeks. I think it's smart. Yeah, and that's the way I want to ask you. Look, Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network came out yesterday and announced there are 13 prospects headed to the NFL draft. If we are looking at years past, and even here in Nashville in 2019, I felt like there was a decent amount of prospects that showed up for the draft who obviously are waiting in the green room, some waiting longer than others in certain situations like what? two years ago with Will Levis yeah. uh, did not expect to be sitting there in, in day two necessarily, but there are 13 guys that are attending just a couple of the names, the obvious, obviously and guys like Marvin Harrison, Jr. Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, Roma Dunze will be there. Cornerback Quinion Mitchell will be there. Um, Terry and Arnold, the cornerback out of Alabama yeah. will be there. But honestly, not a lot of names on this list. Are we seeing a different time, day and age, where, you know, these guys are just cool with being at home with their friends and family. We've got technology now. They take the the shots with them celebrating there. It's it's not as much about being there and being on camera and wearing the suits anymore. I think it's just like we want to be on our own. Is that because they don't want no surprises. They don't want to look foolish when they're se- they're sitting there in the second round. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a little bit of both. I, I will say this. I think this event is still top tier, though. That's just my personal opinion. I still think there's a level of top tier. And if you get the invite and you know you're a first rounder, you go. But Joe Alt's not going. Olu Fashionu's not going. Um, and there's a few other players that's not going also, Caleb, because I think it is to your point. I think Fashionu and Joe Alt are fine, right? They're first yes. rounders bona fide. Yeah. But when you, you're a French guy, you may slip further than you think you should. Like, I look at a guy like Olu Fashionu as of late, right? Like, there's been conversation that his stock is somewhat slid back. And do you want to say, all right, I'm a top 12 guy 
and then I'm going at 18. Like, that's essentially another hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half that you got to wait if it's, if it's 15 minutes per pick, if it's still the same, right? So there's a lot of that that plays into how do I want to spend my time? Right. To your point, Kayla. And this year's draft with the idea that there may be so many trade up and trades back and stuff like that, um, it'll be fascinating. But I think it's smart for guys that don't want either the attention or don't want those cameras in your face if you're in a position like, let's go Roma Dooms, uh, Doomsday, mm-hmm. right, who may be the second wide receiver pick. Well, what if there's a run and then he go, and then Marvin Harrison Jr. goes and then they somebody moves up to take another tight end or Bo Nix jump up? What Anything crazy can happen. Then I'm sitting there twirling my fingers and just waiting with all these cameras, all these other players around me who are probably just as embarrassed as I am. If it's me and I got an opportunity to be a, a bona fide number one, though, I'm probably going to take him up on it. But this 13 list is probably appropriate for what it should be. Like, go if a you know you're one of those guys. probably first round. Because, yeah, you're yeah. looking at it, and you've only got three quarterbacks, Ramon. Jaden Daniels, like I mentioned, Caleb Williams, and then the third one on this list is Drake May. And I think in the past, that's the position you you get hit the most with sometimes as a quarterback yeah. is like, oh, damn, I'm still here in the mm-hmm. green room and it's awkward and I'm on the phone with the girlfriend on the side of me or mom. Right. And it's like this year, I think it's the three that you know for sure, for sure are going to go because we're still talking about do we see some of these guys slip yeah. up to the first round, um, you know, with a Michael Penix Jr. or a And I think it's smart that J.J. McCarthy And J.J. McCarthy, yeah, we I do too. I, mean, I know he's got a lot of media traction and stuff like but that. But is it draft lies? But is he, exactly, is is he actually a first-round draft pick? It'd be awesome to be there to hug Adele and, you know what I'm saying? But there's <laughs> no guarantee that nobody, the, the way J.J. McCarthy's been reported, there is no real true understanding that NFL teams feel that way about exactly right because if buffalo moves up it can reshake the entire draft they need a wide receiver right does Mm -hmm. that mean they go up to number five it doesn't mean they go up to number four you know and at that point a lot of stuff changes um for those quarterbacks and everybody else too because the board changes at that point as far as the draft goes Mm, it's going to be fun. I have a feeling there's going to be some chaos in the first round, and I'm all here for it. And the cameras don't make it no better. Though. No, they do not. They do not you, make it I feel like some of these guys grow up literally at the draft yeah. <laughs> in oh. these situations. Coming up next on RK Dub, let's switch to some hoops talk. Kentucky, technically still in the search for a new head coach, but they could have their guy. Is this like a last-ditch effort We'll hear from our good friend of the Sporting News, Bill Bender. He's coming up next on RK Dub here on 104.5 The Zone. What's going on? It's Will Bowling. Do you or someone close to you find it maddening to hear conversation when there's background noise? Maybe it's while you're dining at your favorite restaurant. Maybe you're watching your favorite team play in the hardwood this past month. You're in a crowded arena, but you find yourself not hearing the person two seats down from you. Well, if so, I want to introduce you to my friends at Brentwood Hearing Center. They've got five doctors of audiology, state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment, and the most recent hearing device technology. Their goal is to get you off the sidelines and back in the game of better hearing. With over 85 years of experience from their convenient location right off I-65 in Brentwood, they have a hearing solution tailored to each individual patient. Their number is 615-377-0420. You can visit them online at BrentwoodHearingCenter.com. Schedule an appointment there today, whether it's for you or for that family member who you know is in denial about how well they can hear anymore. We've all got them. So remember this number, 615-377-0420, online at BrentwoodHearingCenter.com. That's Brentwood Hearing Center, better hearing, better life.
Welcome back into RK Dub on this beautiful Friday morning here in Middle Tennessee. Kayla Anderson, Ramon Foster, and joining us now to talk a little college hoops and everything. He does it all. Bill Bender of the Sporting News. Bill, it's been a minute. How are you, my friend? Hey, Bill. Hey, I'm doing great. It's great to catch up with you guys again. I know we can go anywhere. We can go college basketball, college football, NFL draft. I'll let you guys just fire away. I know. That's that's a thing we love about having you on is you can talk anything. Let's kick it off with the, the newest uh, news out there. And it looks like Mark Pope uh, being named the head coach of Kentucky's men's basketball team. All right. Give us your real thoughts on this, <laughs> Bill. Well, you could take mine or you could just look at the Kentucky fans on Twitter and entertain yourself for hours. <laughs> I mean, this has been a wild run because – I thought when John Calipari left, first of all, I was driving back from the women's final four on Sunday night, and uh, I, I, I thought I was hallucinating. I woke my wife up. I said, is this real? Like, what, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like, and now that Kentucky, I'm not, I think Mark Pope is just in an unenviable spot because we all know they wanted Scott Drew. They probably called Hurley. They probably called, they didn't call Patino, according to the reports, but, you know, UK fans we're, we're dying to get him back. So even though Pope is a Kentucky guy, when you're not the first choice, you're always going to feel that at a major place like that. So when it comes to the blue bloods of college basketball nowadays, how long can you really just hold on to, okay, we were a blue blood, right? And we've seen it with, with an Indiana program that has kind of struggled for a while now. And Now you're looking at Kentucky, the projection of this program moving forward. You can't really live on the fact that we're a blue blood, right? Well, they've won the the conference's last national championship in 2012. But you guys are closer to it. So I wonder if you feel kind of how I do about the Big Ten, where it's a great point about Indiana. When I was growing up, it was Indiana came first. And now you look at the Big Ten and you could say, well, Michigan State's the best program or Purdue's the best program or, you know, Ohio State and Michigan have their moments as well. So I think it's spread out where, and I feel that way about the SEC now where, you know, Alabama made the final four run, Tennessee's an elite 18, Auburn's made a final four run. Um, It's not Kentucky and everybody else anymore in that conference. Bill Bender with us this morning. Bill, you're right. I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I've, I've enjoyed some blue tears, man, on social media. (laughs) <laughs> I had no idea when when this search happened and the, the speculation that Cal was going to leave UK. So I heard somebody say, man, I wonder how many no's they get. Did you expect this many people to turn down the University of Kentucky basketball program to get to Mark Pope? Well, uh, it's very comparable to what I do in college football when Alabama and Nick Saban retired. And this is a different situation because Nick Saban is obviously, I think, considered the the greatest college football coach of all time. Whoever was going to follow that up was going to have trouble. I think in Kentucky, it comes down to, you're not just the coach of the Kentucky men's basketball team. You you have to shoulder those expectations where they are waking up today expecting to win the national title next year. And those tournament failures were really flagrant. This year was bad, by the way. That Oakland game, I know Jack Golke became a household name, but I thought in that game, they just poorly coached defensively. They chased him around the whole time, left the middle of the court wide open. It was one of the weirdest games I've ever watched. So when it when it when we get to this point now, well, last weekend when we looked at um them the the boosters, the the money people, right? As far as saying we need to make change, and you know they when they had their meeting with Bernhard, it was like, man, they stripped him of some of his powers. Was that the end of it, right there? And are we at a world now with with everybody, every university, Bill has money, money, right? It, are we at the point to where you have to somewhat put your boosters to the side and say, hey, you can't make these sports decisions for us, or are they just simply too powerful? Well, I. A good friend of mine, Ralph Russo, Associated Press writer, had a great point last night on social media. Of, mi- of the many things I laughed at on social media yesterday, um, <laughs> he he in this morning included with Jason Day's golf outfit. Um, yes. Ralph had a great point that stood through to me. He said, it's just hard to be an athletic director these days because no matter who you hire at a major program, football or basketball, um, it's 
fans, if they don't like it, you're going to get drilled. And you may have made a good hire, and they just don't see it that way. I, I mean, Mark Pope could do a fantastic job there. Who knows? But because he's not the popular choice, it, it's almost like mob rule to hire football and basketball coaches. We've seen it at Tennessee. We've seen it at Michigan. We've seen it at Ohio State. We've seen it at multiple places over the years. Bill Bender of the Sporty News, senior writer there, does a great job covering everything in terms of college football, college basketball, you name it, he covers it. Bill, so now that John Calipari is down at Arkansas, has been introduced, has pretty much said we have no team. (laughs) So there is obviously a building process that has to happen. What has to happen for him to have success there? Because we know their tradition is rich in hoops. Yeah, and I mean, they, they got him with the money to get there. And I, you know, I'm a kid that grew up with the Nolan Richardson teams that were amazing. And I still, as somebody that coaches a little bit of youth sports basketball, I always point to that 94 Arkansas team because one of my favorite stats from them is they had eight guys on that team that averaged seven points or more. So it doesn't have to be one guy. That's the speech you use when you say it doesn't have to be one guy. If he can bring that kind of talent down to Arkansas um, – they're going to be pretty good. He can still coach. I just think – I actually think for John Calipari, it's great because he gets out of Kentucky where the expectations can be overwhelming. He gets a fresh start. He's seen as a savior. I mean, as good as Musselman was there, they haven't had a coach of this stature since Nolan Richardson. You're up in Big Ten country. Oh. Down here in SEC country, we've definitely seen – better basketball in the last several years. Definitely think this conference um, has some good coaches, obviously the players and teams. So you see Purdue make it to the championship game. Um, you've you've named it, you know, Tennessee to the Elite Eight. We saw Alabama in the Final Four. Who are the, the, the best conferences right now when you're looking at basketball? I mean, the SEC, the Big Ten, uh, ACC had a strong tournament in Big East. I, I think all four can make a case. You know, I mean, obviously, UConn it has separated them, it themselves as the power. And, I mean, it's wild to say that Danny Hurley is – I had this conversation this week. He's the best co- coach in college basketball. He's the only one – the only other guy with uh, two national titles at their current school is Bill Self. The only other guy after that with multiple national titles is Rick Pitino. So, yeah, Danny Hurley's the guy. Uh, Big Ten, there's still frustration, right? Like uh, – if I could take my journalist hat off for a second. Yes. I I wanted to see the big 10 win one because it's been so long. I just didn't like their game plan. I mean, yeah, I think UConn was happy to see Zach Eady take as many shots as they did because he didn't want Purdue to make a bunch of threes and it worked. It did. Bill Bender, uh, a senior writer for the Sporting News is with us this morning. Bill, you said you covered the, the women's national championship game. As it pertains to the women's game in college and the men's game also, is there more star power? Is there more eyes? And not just because of Caitlin uh, on the women's game than it is the men's right now? And I might be out of bounds with that. Well, I, you know, yeah. I mean, by the TV viewership, yeah. And I think Caitlin had a large part in that. But I think the entertainment value was high. I mean, I was there and, man, she – she controls the temperature of the arena. When she pulls up for a three, the entire arena kind of takes a deep breath. It, she is a m- remarkable player. Um, but also South Carolina was a remarkable team with what Don was able to do there. And again, kind of like that Nolan Richardson team, a lot of players that could compete. They just had so many good players. Now, as far as the popularity piece, I mean, I don't, I try not to compare them too much because I think part of the problem with the men's game is and you know this, that, that guys leave after their freshman year. You don't get attached to – me personally, I don't get attached to college basketball teams like I did maybe in the 1990s when you had North Carolina's guys would stay for three years. The fab, I mean, Juwan Howard and Jalen Rose played three years at Michigan. Mm-hmm. So I think with the women's side, you can get attached to Juju Watkins because she'll be there for two more years and Hannah Hidalgo. And the play is fun to watch. And Caitlin – I'll say this. She she was definitely worth the price of the mission. It was a lot of fun watching her play. No doubt. Um, speculation's been brewing, too, also about the ACC. How close are we to seeing Florida State and um, Clemson join the SEC? I've even seen people want to attach them to the Big Ten also. You know, I think for Florida, this is 
maybe a take, but I think Florida State makes more sense in the Big Ten. I do. I, I think – I don't know that – Rick Sankey seems less about in a big hurry to add more teams. Like, you have to be really, really worthy to get in the SEC. Whereas I think the Big Ten – I mean, they – I, if, if I was the Big Ten commissioner and Florida State popped open, I'd grab them and then I'd twist Notre Dame's arm. I'd say, this is it. You know, there, there's no excuse for you to be in the ACC. You're coming to us, and it makes sense. Um, but they could go down to the SEC. Clemson could. This is something to watch. And, and I'll be clear, I don't want to see the ACC die. I, I don't think it's good for the health of the sport. I didn't think it was good that the Pac-12 kind of disintegrated. I think there was some other factors there you know, leadership wise that allowed that to happen. And I hope it doesn't happen to the ACC. One more question on that too. You were talking about just the, the PAC 12 dissolving, obviously a lot of those teams going in different directions, some the big 10, some the big 12. I'm curious with all the conference switcheroos that have happened, who has the most difficult time adapting to their new conference bill? That's a great question. I think, well, Texas is kind of set up to come into the SEC and play right away. They got a good quarterback room. They got a lot of talent that's coming off the playoff appearance. Uh, Pac-12 wise, what I'm going to be interested to see is how Washington, Oregon, UCLA, and USC adapt not only to the travel of Big Ten schools, but the style. I mean, I've sat through a lot of just brutal noon games in the Big Ten that. Otherwise, people outside of Big Ten country, they're not watching those. So, but it's physical. It's, you know, at the line of scrimmage, those kind of things. How do those Pac-12 schools build themselves around? I do think Oregon's position to come into the Pac Big Ten and possibly win it right away. I mean, that Ohio State game on October 12th is going to be really good. Oof, can't yeah, wait for that. I know. And, and just real quick, too, before we, we, we let you go here is this. How, how do you expect the travel for USC, for UCLA, for Oregon – um, to, to really affect them going to the Big Ten country? Well, it won't affect football. It'll affect everything else. Yeah. I okay. mean, you heard, Cameron, you heard Cameron Brink about that last week. The Stanford forward said you know, part of the reason she went to the WNBA, she didn't want the travel. And I'm thinking of it as a parent. If my kid was on the UCLA softball team, I don't think I'd be super excited to be going to Iowa. and go, You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's a lot of travel for families. And I think those are the sports – that are going to feel it the most as opposed to football and men's and women's basketball where they'll be it. So if football ever breaks off and does its own thing, just have the conferences be the way that they are. Yeah, and I think eventually that's the way that we probably see it go, uh, Bill. Bill Bender of the Sporting News, you can follow him. Great work on Twitter, at BillBender92. Bill, let's not wait again for like four (laughs) months to do this again. Oh, no problem. Thanks so much, guys. I always enjoy talking to you. Appreciate, appreciate you, Bill. you, Bill. Have a great weekend. Man, good conversation yeah. with him. Right he, like there. I said, he touches on everything. So um, some good insight there. I thought that was also interesting about the addition of maybe FSU more so to the Big Ten than the SEC. But he is right. Greg Sankey has been very vocal on we don't want to just expand to expand. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the process of getting into the SEC is going to be a lot more detailed, more so than it is the Big Ten at this point. So that was a good point by Bill. It, it, it was, man. And I didn't realize that's why Cameron Brink went to the WNBA. Yeah, that's – I did True. not know that it, either. Yeah, but it makes sense. Especially if you got two road games within the same week, too. Sure. I think the women play on Sunday and – what is it, Sundays and Wednesdays? Is it Wednesdays? Wednesdays? Yeah. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. But it depends. What if you got to go to Iowa, like you said, and then, the, you know, Iowa State the next week? I mean, the next couple of days. And on top of being at a high educational institution like that where you, grades do matter also. You know, and, and that's why I was asking as far as the football side of it is <laughs> you may have to set up your schedule to leave earlier. You know, NFL sure. teams, you know, East Coast teams leave early to go to the West Coast and it's vice versa. So I think it's a bigger adjustment at hand and I think we want to give credit for. I think we'll probably as fans and consumers say, oh, they'll get it done. Well, we'll see what that looks like and if it does impact uh, recruiting and stuff like that. But that is a, a a difference right there. And I'm telling you, for the young fellas, playing a football game and then having to fly back to the East Coast, losing all those hours, that's a different world right there. I'm telling you, I don't think it's going to be as easy of a transition as people think. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a former Pac-12 person. I really think it's reality, especially with some of these other Olympic sports that we've been talking about. 
So speaking of head coaches, and he mentioned Dan Hurley and, you know, why would you leave UConn if, if you have all the resources there and you have a chance to win three state titles? Look, Dan Hurley has done a heck of a job building what he's built there. Yeah, and yeah. there is definitely, you know, tradition in that program. There's other coaches before him that won titles as well. But I love this mentality. And you brought this to us. So we we met yesterday after the show and you said, I want you to listen to this conversation um, on Twitter. The winning difference is the X account for that. And just went into a little bit about his mentality on, although we're in the new age of like recruiting and how you coach a team, he's kind of an old school guy. There's measurable talents you have to have, right? The, the height, the speed, the skill set. Um, but we spent a lot of time really focusing on on the parents. The parents. Yeah, on, on the parents. Are, are they are, are they going to be fans while they're on campus of of their son, or are they going to be or, or are they going to be parents? Are they going to um, you know hold them accountable? Um, have an expectation that when something goes wrong, um, that it's not the, the coach's fault. That it's uh, their son's got to work harder. He's got to do more. He's got to earn his role. Uh, we've got a real old school culture here of accountability. Um, I'm an old school coach in terms of the tone I take with my players in practice, the expectations with effort, um, the focus on, on on winning and we over me. Like, what does that mean? Have they played on seven different travel teams? Have they transferred to four or five different high schools? Um, when you talk to the parents in the recruiting process, are they constantly complaining about the coaches after a bad game, or are they, you know, sending you a text or are you having a conversation, uh, you know, where, where their son is, has got to do more, he's got to play harder, um, you know, he's he's got to work on his skills. You, they they tell on themselves, they drop hints, and um, you know, you, you've got the wrong type of kind of. You know, people in that inner circle around your players, uh, they'll sink your program. Ooh. Wow. Those are some facts. I, I'm interested to what you think about this. You're a parent, first yeah. of all, with kids that are <clears throat> athletes, and you're at the high school level and, and a little bit lower right yeah. now for that. But this this stood out to you. It did, because he put parents on notice. And he also put kids on notice, too, as far as, like, look, I'm, I might not be for you. I'm here to tell you, we have a workers, grinders mentality here. I'm all about commitment and making you better. And as this stands for a guy like him, Dan Hurley, he's proven he can make you a winner. Savage Stone Hurley, he has a lottery pick, a first rounder on his team right now. You can come there and get right. Sure. It's not like you can't, but that conversation of parents and recruiting and kids is is a hot topic in today's world where, again, travel teams. The coaches that run travel teams, how they judge kids and how they coach kids up and how the kids respond to them and stuff like that. I've heard it said recently, and even on the high school level, Kayla, to where I've seen people not want to deal with kids who are really good because of the parents. You know what I'm saying? And that also takes it to the next level. Like, it, it, that's, that's one of the things I, and I wanted to play it just because, like, Middle Tennessee is huge with travel basketball, baseball, football, seven on seven stuff, volleyball, softball. Yeah. It's huge here. So parents, as we kick off this summer, these summer months, okay? <laughs> the long summer months. Let's let's revisit back to Dan Hurley as we, you know, support our kids, as we go through these hot summer days and this travel, like you're there for support and to help them be better. But also if you got a coach that you trust and to be hands off with them and coaches, I charge y'all too, especially you travel coaches. You got to, you got to coach. You can't just expect the kids to be better. That's one thing that Hurley also said too, Yeah, is I'm here to coach you hard. I'm here to make you better. And I don't think a lot of these coaches on these travel teams do exactly that either. And, of course, the parents and the kids have to be on board with it too. But as we kick off this summer stuff and this basketball and, you know, everybody's traveling around and getting recruited and stuff, I, I bookmarked keeping this Dan Hurley conversation because it's so rich, Kayla. I love it. Uh, and it's just, it was dope from a coach who's a friggin' winner that's saying this. And that's the thing. You can still win with an old school mentality sometimes. Yeah. You don't have to always be like, let it loose, like let the kids run just the let program. Them do it. Right. It, it sometimes is okay to have that and, and you can see winning. 
Yeah. L. They did back-to-back -back years. They might do it three in a row. So it's coming from the man himself, Dan Hurley. I thought that was excellent stuff. It and was. you're right. A, a something for parents to keep in and mind, too. And I'm not too. attacking the parents. No, I'm just telling you, this is what coaches think. Absolutely. They recruit you, too. You want to be a winner? Yeah. It's how to be a winner. Let your kid go. I, and that's even a testament to myself. It is. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, go do your thing. I trust you. Sure. Well, trust us to wrap up the show here as we return. We've got one final segment. We'll give a Masters update. Tiger Woods did finish his first round. Uh, going backwards just a little bit. We'll give Come you the on, update. Tiger. Yeah, I know. That's coming up next on RKW here on 104.5 The Zone. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson for the Wang Vision Institute. Uh, you know, we always go in. We get our doctor's appointments every year, dentist appointments two times a year if you're really good at that. But the eye appointments when it comes to your eye health care, that's probably not something that most of us do. At least I'll raise my hand and said I did not do it in like 20 years. And then finally, a few months ago, I decided to go into the Wang Vision Institute. They did the whole check on my eyes and made sure that I'm good for the future as well as right now. They also make sure that your skin is in check. And they're introducing the intense pulse light treatments right now. Really simple, non-invasive treatment, a photofacial treatment to be exact, rejuvenating the skin after sun damage. Maybe you're seeing those dark spots appear. This can help with all of that. They uh, even out your skin tone in terms of this treatment, texture as well as hyperpigmentation. So for more information on IPL treatments along with other services, you can vis visit wangvisioninstitute.com today. And speaking of your uh, vision and talking about your eye care, you can also go online. They have a free online vision seminar, which is pretty cool. That's every Tuesday at 6.45 p.m. Just if you want to learn about more in terms of that instead of just going in right away. You can schedule your free consultation and your treatment today at wangvisioninstitute.com.
Welcome back into Ramon, Kayla, and Will. And we're glad that you choose us here on 104.5 we The are. Zone. It's we a, are, I feel man. This, this song makes me feel good. This song I don't know why. Classic, but it, but it hits. I don't know yeah. if y'all have caught up on this or not, but I, I play this every Friday in our last segment. Have you oh really? My this gosh. is like my Friday song. This gets me ready that. for the weekend. I didn't even realize you did that. Okay, I like it. Well, well, we got a tradition now. I was just going to say. Other, Wait, what would proud. you say that what? like we're a new Boom. family together? What a segue. Boom. <laughs> what a professional right there. The masters, like, like not, unlike no. anything other. Yeah. Or whatever. The, I, just, I just screwed it all up. You know what? Screwed words, Kayla. Up. Words will get Man. you every once in a while. We That's say a right. lot. We say a lot. What you got for us? What's the well, update? Yeah, speaking of the masters, and we're underway. They had to complete the first round after some, you know, conditions were a little Weather bit conditions. iffy last year. Yeah. By the way, the wind yesterday, mm-hmm. like, it was crazy out there. The gusts at some times that you saw when, when the guys were out on yeah. the tee or something and yeah. the gust would pick up. It's like their pants were like, oh, wow. like you know, yeah. swinging and everything in the wind. It was intense. Um, we'll see how the weather is today. It looks a little bit better out there. But Tiger Woods finished his first round about an hour ago. He is at plus one, folks. Eef. So he came into today finishing the round at one under, one under. and now he's plus one. So we'll, well see what yeah, he does in yeah. the second round. Come on, Tiger. Got to get it. Can I ask you guys a question about golf? Yeah. Why does everybody hate Bryson DeChambeau? I will answer that. I have no idea. Go ahead. First of all, I um, talked to my husband Travis about this yesterday because Bryson DeChambeau is leading the way at seven under right now. Had a phenomenal round yesterday. He is known as the mad scientist. Right. I'm familiar right? with his antics about being juiced up, jacked up. The dude is uh, uh, the Hulk, essentially. So, like, the Bruce Banner portion where he's a very smart guy. When he yes. started his golf career, he was a skinny kind of dude, and then he transformed in this gym rat. That, exactly. That, that's as far as I know as so, it goes with him. We knocking him for that? So, I no. Oh. I think in the golf world, it is very traditional in the way that they do things sometimes in terms of the game. Like, you know, when you change your putters and, and the certain things that guys decide to do individually, because it is an individual sport for the most part. Right. Sometimes it's scrutinized. And I think he came in as kind of the odd dunkly, duckling. He came in very young. Um, in some ways, he was immature in terms of how he approached the media. And a lot of the other players just didn't like him because he was kind of the odd man out in terms of how he thought, because he was a little bit of the mad scientist. He was always you know, trying to change things and make things innovative. And with it being such a traditional sport, it's not always accepted like that. But I do think since going to the live tour, which he recently did, he's changed things up. He's become a little bit more mature in his approach of things. And now I think he goes in the direction of he's not going to probably be that odd man out as much anymore. And I think this is a growing up process that we saw even before our eyes yesterday in that first round. I mean, he played some really good golf and I enjoyed listening to him after his round, but that's kind of the background on, on him. He was just not, he was, he was the ugly duckling. Yeah. I just saw a lot of hate yesterday for him leading. And I I knew, Mm -hmm. I knew about the mad scientists out there. Yeah. Right. And people kind of say that he's whiny, but it's like, what, what athlete is not whiny? What, what, what do these guys, we work with one every day. This guy in here is so (laughs) whiny. Where's my (laughs) drink? Where's my coffee? You weren't supposed to spill the beans on that. (laughs) Look, I I gotta, I gotta let. We gotta gotta go to the Predators game tomorrow together. We have to sit by each other. I didn't even think about that. I thought he had two days to forgive. Uh, it just seems to me that he was different. Or maybe he just got a bigger bag now from Liv, so I'm he different. has the ability yes, to I'm live like them. That's, Let that's him be why. different, man. He Such looks good now. Sport. He dropped the weight. He looks he good. Yeah. Oh, I see that. So him... what's the mad scientist part? I know we got to wrap up, but what Because what, he was, was he experimenting doing? with different things, and, you know, he's innovative. On the course? Just, yeah, so now yeah. He, he gained all the muscle so he can drive farther, which yeah. cuts his total number of strokes down. Yeah. So, like, just experimenting with different yeah. things. They and mad at him for bettering his strokes? That's, that's what I'm telling you. I'm they, telling they you. They don't want us out here getting yeah. better strokes, Mom. They By the way, he has what? a whole new set of clubs, too, that are also innovative, that are clearly helping because... Yeah. He's had a heck of a first If we can't round. better our stroke, Burke, then what the heck are we doing out here, man? I don't know. They don't want to see us live, man. 
<laughs> Let us live. By the way, the Live Tour coming here to Nashville this summer. So he'll be out there if you want to go root on the mad scientists. For us, though, we are not mad. We are leaving you happy. And uh, Ramon Foster always giving words of advice. Hey, y'all be safe in these Nashville streets this weekend because it's going to be nice. All right. But at all times, remember, your Twitter fingers and your mic is always hot.